Hello whiskey folk, hello everyone, how are we? It's Roy, another Thursday night, quarter to ten, welcome everybody to the V-Pub, welcome all you magnificent barflies that have been in here chatting for a long time now, hanging out and speaking to each other in the lounge. Pull up a seat, pour yourself something nice, perhaps something from a sherry cask, and uh, tell us all what you're sipping. If you'd like a shout out from me, I'll pull up the chat screen in just a wee second and give as many of you of you uh, as I can a shout out um, by typing the word barfly and say hello to everybody. It's fantastic to see so many in again tonight. It's fantastic to have so many of you supporting in general. But of course, I need to mention a big thing right at the head of the show. Thank you all so, so much for helping me to achieve the wonderful uh, milestone of hitting 10,000 subscribers on this channel. Now that in itself is a fantastic thing. Subscribers are still a very valid metric and it's a wonderful achievement. I'm really, really excited about it. But what I'm amazed about is just how utterly connected, how engaged you guys are with comments and messages, likes, as well as your subscriptions as well. So thank you so, so much for that. And I have got a fantastic giveaway to share with you um, and I'll give you details on that giveaway in just a second. Something to help celebrate. Um, let's jump into the chat quickly. There's lots of it, and it's scrolling, scrolling quite fast already. Fantastic. Sunday evening scotch is, is in. Michael, good to see you. He's, seen he's sip, sipping a Glendronach 21. Perfect. It's a parliament. Superb. George Braley is in saying, where's your tan, Aquavite? That was cloudy in Texas, unfortunately, unfortunately George. Skippy Van Pobb is in. James McGoran. Evening Royal, let's get on to the barflies. James McGoran from Sweden is shouting barfly. Good to see you, James. Whiskey Novice uh, is also shouting barfly. Malt Reviews in as well. Good to see you, Jason. Kresimir Jelcic is in shouting barfly. Good to see you, my friend. As well as Mikey Hay, Thomas Elmer. Uh, Hoyt Hemphill as well. Good to see you, Hoyt. Ebb from over in Norway. Uh, Kilted Moose Scott in Glasgow has been out at a nice sherry cast tasting tonight. He was at a, a Glen Farkless tasting. Uh, in Clydeside Distillery in Glasgow. Good to have you in, Scott. I hope you're feeling nice and rosy after your tasting down the road. Uh, Patrick CC, that looks like a new name. Welcome in, my friend. He's saying Barfly Sneakers and Scotch is saying Barfly as well. Wonderful to have you in, my friend. Service Alafis, uh, that's Andreas from Norway, is saying Barfly as well as Skog Smart. Uh, McAllen Fine and Rare, good to see you, Doc. Good to see you. I'll be seeing you in Glasgow, of course, in a couple of weeks' time for the festival. And then just a few weeks after that, I'll see you for Inter Whiskey over in Frankfurt as well. I know we've been speaking about that and things are starting to get exciting. I've got some news about um, the Sunday, the 10th of November, which is the day after the Glasgow Festival. I'm planning on gathering myself. Uh, I'm hoping to get um, a venue. It looks like I've managed to secure a venue, just waiting on it being finalised, a place that we can open some whiskey and share it together, maybe do a little bit of a structured thing at the start and then just have an open sharing event on the Sunday afternoon. That's the Sunday, the 10th. It'll be in the city centre of Glasgow. So uh, stay tuned to the social media channels and I'll obviously share with you um, uh, through YouTube if I, if I possibly can as well, if that actually uh, gets finalised and goes ahead. Andy C is in, good to see Andy down in East Kilbride. Whiskey Shared Toby is in, good to see you Toby. Alistair Gray, I'm actually sipping a dram from you Alistair, thank you very, very much. Uh, the bottles did leak a wee bit, but it seems they only leaked enough to spoil the label. I can still read that this is a hand-filled Glendronic, which tastes absolutely fantastic. No details of the cask on this, but I can tell you from just sipping it that this is a delicious sherry cask and it's fantastic as well, Alistair. Thank you so much for your generosity. Annie Tiger is in. Jay Chung, my friend, you'll be back home now. Wonderful to meet you a couple of weeks ago. He's, he's in St. Barfly. Good to see you, Jay. Pete Head, Eric Way, Eric from California, good to see you, good to see you Pete Head as well. Uh, just as the chat jumps down, I may have lost a lot of those mentions. Um, 
Raster is spelling barfly in a slightly different way. I don't care how you spell it, Raster. It's good to welcome you around, my friend. It's been a while since I've seen you around here, and it's certainly good to welcome you here again. Our baggy is in as well. Andy's saying good evening, Roy. I hope you've recovered from Rotterdam, my friend. Loved seeing the Instagram pics of you and Jason over there having a blast. I would love to go that one year, maybe next year. Hoyt is saying um, eh, that would be a tan for me. Um, the, weather in, the weather in Texas... Um, was incredible, and I think it, it was a hammer blow demonstration of how they are maturing whiskey over there. When we arrived, we got off the plane, the heat hit us like a wall, 99 degrees, very, very warm. The next morning we woke up, and even at its peak during that day, it only reached 48 degrees. So th those two days in contrast with each other kind of mimicked the temperature shift that Texas sees even from day to night. Um, so you can see how that affects the whiskey, those huge swings in temperature. I mean, a 50 degree swing in temperature, you could see how that might affect whiskey maturation, right? Wonderful to witness. Um, but the weather was much more comfortable and easy than last year, Hoyt. Whiskey Radar is in. Good to see my friend saying, hi, Roy, sipping a Bowmore 15 lime rig for starters. Good for you, my friend. Nice to welcome you in as well. Spiritworks Tom is saying, evening, Roy. Thank you so much, Tom, for your generosity as well. Just did some lovely uh, samples from you too. Wonderful to have you all in. Um, and uh, Eric Quay is mentioning to Karen. Uh, that means that Karen Hughes must be in. I hope you are, Karen. Wonderful to have you saying you were in my video on Annandale with Roy. She was indeed. She, jo she joined us on the trip, Eric. Still is saying, was such a pleasure to hang with you, Aquavite. Jesse, it's just fantastic to welcome you in here as well, my friend. If you're back home down in New Zealand already, I know the time difference is going to mean it's very early hours of the morning for you. And I'll raise a little glass and say it was an absolute pleasure to meet and hang out with you as well. Jesse's got a fantastically interesting channel. Um, he's actually distilling at home. Apparently, the legislation in New Zealand allows such things. Um, and he's got a fantastic channel. You should go and check out uh, Jesse if you're interested in these things on Still It. Fantastic guy as well. Skog Smart is saying, wait a sec, it's Sherry Cask. I've always thought it was Cherry Cask. I'm confused. Tonight very much is about Sherry Cask. That's the theme. Um, I'm going to get a couple of things out of the way housekeeping-wise first. Um, but the reason that I've been wanting to do the Sherry Cask theme for a while, because always when you're in the kind of whiskey um, sphere, if you like, if you're reading comments and reading articles and reading follow-up comments, you quickly pick up that there's a lot of confusion about, specifically about Sherry Cask maturation, how it's come to be and how it's applied in uh, modern terms. And I've always had it in my mind that it would be a good topic because we do love our sherry matured Scotch whiskies, don't we? It's certainly um, inextricably linked with Scotch whisky sherry cask maturation. And when you get a really good sherry cask matured product, I think it really stands out. There's nothing quite like it. Especially coming into this time of year, I find that those kind of warm, spiced fruits, that those nutty flavors, that texture, um, I think it just kind of fits. So a lot of people talk about it being Christmas cake in a glass, talk about it being Christmas whiskies, and I can kind of understand where they're coming from. But there is a lot of misunderstanding around sherry maturation. But I never felt truly confident and hosting such a topic myself. It would, if I hosted it myself, it would just very much be a kind of discussion. Um, I felt that it would be a nicer thing if we could bring in somebody from the industry who could help shed a bit of light. And I wanted somebody, of course, that was going to be involved in whiskey production that very much relied on sherry cask maturation. And that's what I've managed to achieve. I can tell you that he's already in just now. He's waiting in the back just for me to get the other things out of the way and we can start off talking about sherry casks. But what I want to do first is talk about how I'm going to celebrate 10,000 subscribers. And of course, there's always a giveaway, right? You can't have a channel based on whiskey sharing if you don't share when you hit these really cool milestones. Um, so a few weeks ago, I was in the Good Spirits Company in Glasgow for uh, a Ralphie uh, bottle release. And Ralphie was releasing a bottle of this Ben Nevis, uh, a four-year-old Ben Nevis, so very, very young but wonderfully bold and flavor full uh, peated Ben Nevis. And you know, the fact that it's four years old is absolutely incidental. This is a cracking whiskey. 
I remember buying a dram of it for Jay Chung when we were in the Bon Accord together, and I was telling him about the whiskey. And as he sipped it, he was just, he was overwhelmed, and he said, I wish I'd managed to get a bottle. A few phone calls later, and he managed to pick up one of the very last bottles in Glasgow. So he's gone back very, very happy. But I went into the Good Spirits Company, and I spoke to Ralphie, and I told him that this was my plan. I wanted um, to give one of the Ben Nevis um, four-year-olds away. And the reason for it was because the Glasgow theme, the Good Spirits Company is the bottler here. This is in collaboration between Ralphie and the Good Spirits Company. I like the Glasgow theme, but I love the fact that it was Ralphie celebrating that big 10 years as well. And I'm a long, long way behind him. I'm only two, two and a half years into this journey, but on YouTube that is. But I'm celebrating a 10 as well, 10,000 subscribers. And I, and I explained this to him. You'll see that the bottle is actually, I hope you can see this, um, I'll pull up my camera just to make sure it's going to focus. You'll see that the bottle uh, is written and signed by Ralphie. It says to celebrate 10,000 subscribers, Aquavite, September 19. Uh, really nice little touch, but this is the bottle I'm going to give away, the, the bottle that's been signed. What I'll also do um, when I draw that on the next VPUB, um, I will open my bottle, which is sitting over my shoulder up here. Um, and when I open that, I'll pour out a selection of samples. I'll fill some sample bottles um, and I'll have a chance to share it. So it's not just one person that gets to taste that pretty limited, but nevertheless, fantastic whiskey. All you have to do to win it, that's what you're waiting for, is just in the comments below this video, not in the comments that you're typing in now. If you're in the lounge, if you're in the chat, that's not what I mean, actually in the physical comments. So you can do it now while it's live or um, perhaps if, if it's fiddly and you're on your phone or something, you might want to wait until the, the video is finished. But just go into the comments of the video and type Barfly, congrats on the big 10. Now that way you're congratulating obviously the Aquavite channel on 10K subs, but you're also congratulating Ralphie on his 10 years as well. I'll look for the comments, I'll compile all the comments from there and we'll do what we always do, we'll just ask for a random draw from Siri and somebody will hopefully win themselves a pretty special bottle of whiskey. Um, on the VPUB, I'll let everybody know how we can uh, they can get their hands on the samples as well, but it's probably going to be um, a random draw, I think. Super fantastic stuff. It's really, really humbling um, that I've managed to hit that mark. And also there's other little things that are unlocked in the YouTube world when you hit that um, threshold as well. And those have started um, to be unlocked now. I just noticed a notification from them the other day that I've now got access to YouTube stories. So I don't believe I've had that kind of thing before. Not sure I'll use it, but you never know. Perhaps I will. So I'm going to raise a glass to every one of you, everybody that's ever liked, ever commented, ever subscribed, ever helped this channel grow in the way that so many of you have. I'm going to raise this glass and say a really heartfelt and huge thank you so, so much. This is a privilege. Slancha. Alistair, this is wonderful. This is a fantastic whiskey. Very nutty, rich, quite dry, flavorful. I wonder what kind of cask it is. If I pull up the chat, you might have mentioned it already. And while, while I've been chatting and had the camera up there, I've had a couple of drams bought for me as well. Wonderful stuff. Um, thank you so much. Who have I missed? Let me try to catch up with you both. My friend Jay has bought me a virtual dram and said I was over the moon. Thanks, Roy. He's obviously talking about managing to get his hands on that four-year-old Ben Nevis. I was very glad that you got it as well, Jay. Thank you so much for your virtual dram, my friend. And I hope it's not the last time we get a chance to hang out. Wonderful vault following uh, Jay's Dine and Drink Instagram channel to follow his journey through Scotland as well. It was very cool. And also from Matt McCain, you start, he's saying, congrats on 10K subscribers, Aquavite and a little cheers glass. Matt, I feel like, are you the Matt that we, did Did we hang out together in La Quinta Hotel in Texas? Are you that Matt? I feel like you might be. If you're not, I apologize, but I think you are. Let me know. Matt, regardless, thank you so much for your virtual dram and it's a pleasure to have you in here again. Wow, and that's how to get through a cast strength sample. 
quite quickly, right? I did get a few other samples in from people this week. I've already mentioned uh, the generous samples that come in from um, Tom as well. He sent me uh, the Bimber first release as a sample. I've got a bottle of that that Bimber reserved. I haven't. I don't have it in my hands yet. Um, but Tom wanted to send me one up uh, to let me try it in advance, and I was very grateful for it as well. Um, and he uh, also I got a message from um, a gentleman called Calderac on. Uh, Twitter and I know this guy we've been interacting for quite a little while and he offered to send me a couple of samples that is from a distillery that's be become quite a talking point he sent me through uh, a Berry Brothers and Rudd uh, single cask daft mill sample and also the Royal Mile whiskey sample as well from daft mill now for those of you that know how crazy it was for anybody to try and get their hands on daft mill when these were released it was absolutely ridiculous and um, to the point that I didn't even engage when I saw the Stramash for those bottles, I stepped back. It's my preference not to get involved in that kind of thing with the idea that if if it's meant for you, it's not going to go past you. And of course, Christophe out in France, Calderac, uh, was kind enough to send me through these to let me try them at least. Wonderful stuff. Um, I've had another uh, dram in from Jeff Patron. Jeff, we certainly met and got to hang out in Texas, my friend, and wonderful. I'm going to uh, uh, look forward to an event like that again. If we, if I can get back to Texas again next year, I'll be there. It's just an amazing thing to hang out with all of you guys, all you whiskey heads, and all you just generous, kind, thoughtful, fun, uh, wonderful people. I hope, I dream that you're like that in the rest of your lives, because it's just an absolute privilege to hang out with you over the course of the weekend. And I hope to be back there again. It was amazing. Look at all the souvenirs I brought back. It's quite incredible. So many of those that you see over my shoulder were not things that I bought. Some of these things, the majority of what you see there were genuine gifts. I was really overwhelmed. Jeff, thank you so much, my friend. Slant your back. I was talking about Daft Mill. Ear whiskey as well. Another virtual dram came in. Guys, I want to talk. <laughs> no, honestly, thank you so much. I'm going to need to pour something. Matt, what will I pour? Will I open another one of Alistair's samples just because they, they're handy here and it's very much in keeping with our theme, isn't it? So this is another Gwendronic that Alistair sent me, another hand-filled. I'm only going to pour a wee drop of this because I managed to finish that whole sample quite quickly. And I'll raise a glass to say cheers. And also Mark Goins as well. You star Mark, thanks so much. He's saying congrats on 10,000. Well deserved. And cheers to 10,000 more. Mark and Matt, thank you both so much. What I will say, if you're interested in a kind of uh, topic over on Matt's channel is Ear Whiskey. It's a podcast style interview format on YouTube. Um, just search for Ear Whiskey. And quite recently, just this week, he released a, a, an interview style a topic uh, between himself and me, where we talked about uh, closed uh, distilleries and should closed distilleries be revived or not, obviously on the back of Rosebank, Brora and Port Ellen. Like it's a new thing. In Scotland, we've been reviving distilleries for 200 years, but it's a very hot topic right now. And we talked about that and uh, I really enjoyed hanging out with Matt for that time. My goodness, guys, the generosity has uh, been gone a little bit crazy. So Matt and Mark Goins, thank you so much. Thank you so much, my friend. Graham Young has also bought me a dram saying cheers to 10,000. Hope to get back to Scotland early 2020. Graham, you don't have the ninja to get in and out of here without me knowing about it, knowing about it, my friend. It would be great to meet you and hang out with you a little while again. Marcus Kreitner um, over there, probably sitting on the couch next to Christina, I hope, saying congratulations on the 10K. And here's a little something for the Sherry Whiskey Fund. Very much appreciated, Marcus, you star. Thank you so much. And Alistair Gray has also bought me a virtual ram saying cask 1930 PX. It's 13 years old, 60% ABV. Congrats and 10K. So the one I've just had then is cask 1930. Exactly. So we're now going into a PX, which is a Pedro Jimenez cask. Um, it's 60% ABV. Al Alistair and everybody else uh, that I can barely keep up with, new stars. Um, 
Zach Andrews. I got to hang out with Zach as well. That was a special surprise. You weren't supposed to be there and you turned up and surprised me, Zach. It was wonderful to see in Texas. Cheers, Roy. He's saying, thanks for being such a great person in our, in our whiskey journeys. Thank you to you for the very same, Zach. The feeling is very much mutual. And Stevie as well, who was awesome. And I got to hang out with him over the weekend. He was in the hotel with me saying, congrats on 10K, Roy. Listen, all you wonderful barflies and whiskey folk, thank you all so very, very much. Wow. I was out last night with Dwayne Large, the superstar that Dwayne is. He's just a fantastic guy, really, really um, connected with everyone in the community. Um, managed to meet Dwayne in Glasgow last night. We got together, had a dram. He bought me a blind dram and I picked it out. And I picked it out because of the flavour I'm picking up on this. There's a sweet cooked raisin uh, and kind of almost maple syrup sweet note that I get from PX casks. And he bought a Glendronic 15. Glendronic 15 is mostly Oloroso, but there's some PX added into the mix and you can taste it. There's a new lick of sweetness to that dram. So of course we were in the pot still, so it narrows down quite um, quickly what the drams are likely to be. It's, it's not any dram in the world, it's the drams that they have at the pot still. And I knew that they had the 12, the 15 and a couple other Glendronics in the pot still. Um, but when he brought it over and I narrowed it down, I said, oh, is this is kind of Highlander space side. And, and he said, yeah. And then I just went for it. I said, I think this could be Glendronic 15. And I was right. It doesn't happen very often, but when it happens, it's wonderful, right? Um, but yes, I'm picking up the PX thing here. Would I have picked it up if I didn't know it was PX? Who knows? Your palate has to be in form to be able to um, pick up those things. Thank you so much. So talking about um, Daft Mill quickly again, I just want to bring this out because I think it's very, very cool. Everybody's after Daft Mill. It's a very small distillery. I don't know what they're filling, something in the order of 100 or so casks a year. Uh, farm distillery, um, very canny. Uh, it took a long, long time, 12 years before their first release actually hit the shelves and came out. It was very well received and rightly so. It was amazing stuff. I bought another bottle, paid over the odds for it because you just have to with Daft Mill. It's sitting up there behind me. Um, it's still sealed. <laughs> I'm going to keep it sealed for a while. Um, but I was very glad to have it back in the collection. And it, I really, really loved that whiskey. I enjoyed it so much. And a lot of people evangelized about it quite rightly so. But now when Daft Miller are, are, is getting released, uh, there is a huge stramash for it, as I mentioned earlier. So I'm very grateful to get samples like this. But what's super interesting is the next release from them is not going to be sold by the bottle. It's going to be um, sold through the independent bars of Scotland, of which one of them is the Bon Accord, um, by the dram only. Fantastic idea, fantastic concept. I fully support anything that Francis and his team and Berry Brothers, everybody involved there is trying to do in order to try and circumvent that hoarding concept, the idea that we're buying something that's an appreciating asset, like a precious metal or something, rather than something that's been, you know, created by the, that man's hard work over the, the last 12 years, purely to be enjoyed. It's, it's pretty sad to consider that the value of it as it creeps up is going to make that harder and harder to happen. Now, I realize that I'm saying that with a sealed bottle over my left shoulder, but I think that you know me by now and know fully that that bottle has been bought and I paid a bit extra for that because I wanted the ability to be able to enjoy that whiskey again and that bottle will be opened and shared at an appropriate moment in the future. I hope you guys had the chance to try some of the Daft Mill as well. Okay, so on to our theme for tonight. I want to try and keep things a little bit neat tonight. I've got a super busy weekend, and I know that my guest who's on tonight has got a busy weekend as well. Sherry Cass have been coming to Scotland for a long time. At least 200 years, there was a time when we loved our sherry and we drank buckets of it, along with wine and rum and other things like that. We loved sherry and we drank lots of it. In time when we were looking for our containers to store and notice I'm very specifically saying store whiskey in because this started at a time when maturation wasn't fully celebrated or fully understood. We took 
these available sherry casks. Now, these would have been transport sherry casks built specifically for the task of shipping backwards and forwards back in a time when bulk shipping of sherry was permitted. And um, eventually, after a few journeys backwards and forwards, these would have been nicely seasoned with the sherry um, and would have eventually been passed over to distillers in order to um, store uh, what would become whiskey, so their new distiller. Um, in time, various forces have conspired. Hoyt has just bought me a virtual dram quickly. He's saying, cheers, barflies, family duty calls. Catch the rest of this later. Enjoying Sherry more after his space side visit. Cheers to you, Hoyt, and it was wonderful to get to meet you and spend a bit of time with you in Glasgow this year as well. Cheers, my friend. Various forces over time has meant that we can't sh buy bulk sherry by the cask anymore. Um, more recently, because of the downturn in, in sherry, more recently things like, the, uh, let's say, relatively more available ex-bourbon casks and things have changed the Scotch whisky landscape. It's changed Scotch whisky's profile and it's given us um, other facets, other styles of Scotch whisky to be able to enjoy. But sherry always stayed a mainstay of us. It was, as I said, as said earlier, in, inextricably linked with Scotch whisky. And a lot of the producers define themselves by their sherry maturation in the products that they present. So when I wanted to invite somebody from the industry to help us understand the history, to help us understand how that's been developed, how it's managed uh, in modern times, logistically and, and in terms of maturation, I had to reach out to somebody in the industry. But what I did is I reached out to a barfly. <laughs> I reached out to somebody who actually hangs out watching these VPubs, occasionally participates. You'll see his name in the comments from time to time. And he's uh, one time he actually, I remember him participating and having a bit of fun in the quiz at the end as well. Um, and it was important that that person had to work in an organization or a producer that was very much uh, Sherry focused. Now, the ones that come to mind are obviously Glenn Farkless, Glenn Dronick, um, McAllen, of course, um, Edrington Group in general, actually, Glenn Rothis and uh, Highland Park as well. But this producer currently has two distilleries making uh, mature product and selling mature product, and that is Ian McLeod. And they have Glengoyne and Tam Du, both uh, completely autonomous um, uh, with sherry maturation. So uh, he was the um, obvious guy to reach out to is, of course, Gordon Dundas. And I'm going to bring Gordon in and introduce him to you all. And you can say hello to him and see him face to face. Cat Smasher has just bought me a, a, a virtual ramp and he said five pounds, 10K only the start, Roy, onwards and upwards. Thank you, Cat, Cat Smasher. Thank you so much for the nice wishes and the virtual ramp. And I think I've had another one in as well. I'm barely keeping up. Beyond Torrey, Rick Vesime, you start. He's saying, congrats on 10K. May the number increase with another 10K. Well done, Roy. I will say thank you very much for the sentiment. If it's 10,000 subscribers to the quality of the last 10,000, absolutely. It's been wonderful, Bjorn. Thank you so much for your drama, friend, Slanjit. Let's get in and grab Gordon. Uh, so you can put a face to the name for those of you who haven't met him in the past and uh, let him introduce himself. Gordon, my friend, thank you for your patience. How, How are, are you? you? I'm very well on this Thursday evening. Yes, great to be here. You might pick up that the pace, I'm struggling a little bit already, right? <laughs> <It's> kind of, <laughs> and um, I, I should have, um, I mean, the, the super, super generous people, all their, all their good wishes for the channel and it, things like that. But I appreciate that you're sitting there in the wings waiting in the background and this uh, event was planned way in advance of anything uh, happening for the channel, hitting that milestone and things. So thank you for your patience. Congratulations, Roy. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. And as I've said it before, and I'll, I'll continue to say it, it never ceases to amaze me just how um, it's nice that you've hit 10,000 subs. But if I was at 100,000 subs and there were this kind of quality of people watching, I, I would need to recruit a team, right? It would be very difficult because they're super, super engaged. They're very, very knowledgeable. Absolutely. Um, and they're very, very generous and kind and polite as well. It's a wonderful wee community that we've got blossoming here. Absolutely. Gordon, I hope I, I gave you 
a kind of a, a rough, let's say not introduction, but an overview. Of course, you're at Ian McLeod uh, now, but you're fairly new, only a couple or three years at Ian McLeod, right? Do you want to give us just a little bit of your background, a, a 30 second resume so people can uh, understand just how much uh, of your time you've spent in the Scotch whiskey landscape? Sure. Well, I mean, it, my, my, I've always enjoyed whiskey, of course, but I started working in it probably in 2003 um, when I started to work for Whiskey Magazine, which is an amazing publication and, you know, has spread the gospel of whiskey worldwide through the magazine and Whiskey Lives and all that yep. sort of thing. So, um, and I worked there for about eight years, something like that. And then um, I actually joined Morrison Beaumore at that point, which was um, Suntory owned, of course. And so it was Beaumore. Glengarry, Ockentoshan, what a great portfolio of single malts they were. Yep. Great team of people there. That changed into Beam Suntory uh, with Suntory's purchase of Beam in 2014. Um, and then I moved to Ian McLeod, which is an independent family-run business, one of those rare things these days, in 2017. And uh, I've been there in a whirlwind two years, which has been fantastic, which has seen the you know, the, the purchase of Rosebank, the the, the the rise of Tamdu as I see it, and, and Glen Glen yes. just being, being wonderful and as it has been for many years. So it's an exciting time um, at Ian McLeod. So yeah, that's my 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 very quick potted history of, of, of my whiskey career, as it were. I'm very, very, um, I, I'll always have a, a soft spot for uh, Glen Goyne. Um, I love Tamdu as well, I really do. I think they're doing fantastic things. We've spoken about this offline. Um, but Glengoyne was the, well, it wasn't the first distillery I visited. It was the first distillery I visited with the vision of visiting a distillery, if that makes any sense. I'd done a Talisker thing many years before. But when I went to Glengoyne, um, and I fully um, blame, and I use the word blame deliberately, <laughs> Glengoyne for starting my journey. It was in 2005. And uh, it was an Italian visitor that I took uh, to Glen Goyne back then because he wanted to go. And I've shared the story many, many times um, with everyone, with the community. Um, mm. But ever since then, I've had a soft spot for Glen Goyne. But I have to say, you continue to bring a very well presented, very clean product, very enjoyable, honest, high integrity product at reasonable prices to the point that I got over myself last year and um, because I always had a bit of a gripe with the 43% thing, right? But I got over it and I named Glen Goyne my distiller and producer of the year last year because I think they fully deserve it. And I think that everything that's coming out of Tam Do now clearly is with the same ethos that we've enjoyed from Glen Goyne over the years. And yeah. we've seen that for a number of years now, actually, from Tam Do. Is yeah, that I mean, it's absolutely true. And that comes only from one place. It comes from the owners and the, the, it comes from Leonard, who is the owner of, of Ian McLeod Distillers. And he's very much the ethos of we will make great, honest whiskey um, and we will make it as well as we can um, to, you know, nothing gets in the way of that. And, and that will be what Rosebank will be like. That is what um, Glen Goyne is and what Tamdu is. And so that's very much our sort of uh, our way that we make whiskey. And that's why we focus on natural color. We focus on uh, Glen Goyne slow distillation and Tamdu. We we focus a lot on obviously what the sherry casts bring to, yes. to Tamdu spirit. So there's a lot of areas of, of, of us to, to that, that we focus on really trying to make the best whiskey. Now, Rosebank will be a different style, of course, that triple distilled, probably mostly ex bourbon, I guess. And we're not here to talk about Rosebank tonight, but certainly the whiskies that you're producing just now at Tamdu and Glen Goyne are super reliant on a very specific type of cask. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I kind of gave a brief resume talking of going back 200 years when we loved our sherry, but that's pretty much how we ended up in this situation. Nobody designed that. Nobody sat down one day and decided that sherry would be the best thing to mature whiskey, right? No, it was one of those sort of, you know, just sort of way things happen, really, in the availability of casks and then really understanding that once they put, you know, spirit in those casks, um, those transportation casks, that, that this, wow, this, this really makes this taste really quite incredible. Um, and that's as simple as it is, really, in terms of the history of sherry cask maturation. So, uh, I mean, like a lot of good things in the world, it sort of happened almost by mistake and through the availability of those casks. Um, 
you know, um, the Scotch whisky industry, as we do, started to pick them off the docks in London, Bristol, Glasgow, wherever, and go, we'll have them, and uh, started filling their, filling them in, in their warehouses, and that's how how it was born in 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 a very simple way. And even I, I hear that at times there would have been. Um people would have been even tracking down casks and things to have at home as a private thing. And, and over time that these um, casks would be allowed to age significantly. So it wasn't just a case of filling it and storing it in, in production areas, but there was examples right across the landscape out there where people had significantly more mature whiskey and they were able to demonstrate just how well this 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 spirit matured inside this, this, uh, this sherry soaked wood, I guess. Yeah, I mean, you know, again, let's face it, I don't think a lot of people knew a heck of a lot about the wood's impact on whiskey back then. I think it was more by chance or by, you know, people discovering casts that maybe been forgotten about and going, wow, this is incredible, or finding out that this has been in there for a few years, more than just a few weeks or or months. And, you know, that's that's sort of how, you know, the, 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 the colour gets imparted into it and the, the you know, the flavours and uh, as we see in whiskey these days. But, I mean, I think if you look at modern day, whiskey we, we probably know a little bit more about maturation now than maybe back then yes yes absolutely there's a lot more money and time spent working out exactly what's going on here and of course yeah. that's one of the things that i love about whiskey in general and life in general but certainly whiskey is littered with examples of how and the word i like to use is serendipity or, you know this kind of accidental happenstance that creates a style or a product that wasn't really designed it's there's almost a feeling in whiskey if you want to be romantic about it which i enjoy being <laughs> is that the whiskey's almost taken care of itself yeah i mean there's also i mean absolutely there's also numerous examples that i've heard you know anecdotally from from other people that i know in the industry of how whiskies were created by accident and and you know this whiskey well it was, it was finished in the wrong cask but this is how this whiskey was created and yeah. and 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 that's the that's the little bit of magic that you need in the industry that's the little bit of a uh, little bit of this is how we made it and it's very honest and that's you know that's how it is and 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 you know in in, in a world of you know we want provenance and we want all those sorts of things i still think there's a huge uh, a huge element of you know when you can produce something that's almost by mistake, you can be quite honest about it and go, well, that's how it was done. <laughs> exactly, that's exactly. This was, the, there was a little bit of, and if we're going to be whimsical, let's be whimsical as we stare at a glass of whiskey, right? Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm just going to give uh, David Patterson a shout out and raise a glass to say thank you so much for his virtual dram, David. No comment there, but thank you, my friend. I'll assume it's another congratulations. Thank you, David. So we've got these um, casks. We're working out that they're pretty damn good. And at that time, if we go back 100 years or so, um, at that time, there's no, there's not a lot of bourbon or ex-bourbon casks going about. But there is a dynamic, and this is one of the things that I want to focus on. One of the things I want to be clear about in this discussion that we're going to have is the huge difference potentially between American oak Um and European oak. So it's Quercus alba versus uh, Quercus robur, I guess, right? Um, yeah. The difference there. Um, so if you just could summarize, because I know there's a, there's a distinct difference between what Bodega casks are in a Solera system, let's say, what they would be made from historically and in modern times, and also yeah. these transport casks that we've already touched on, what they would be made from historically and perhaps in modern times. And then I know that we've got a little kind of practical thing that you and I can do together because you very kindly sent me across some a cracking opportunity to test this thing side by side. But mm. talk about the effect that those different oaks have on the product. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, the first thing to say, and that is that is the the key aspect here, is and a lot of people sometimes forget this, is that it's the oak that matures whiskey. Yeah. So it is the oak and the opening up of that oak through charring and toasting, um, certainly in a bourbon cask or in a or toasting in a sherry cask, that, 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 that allows the color to eke out, allows the, the flavors to come out. So it's a desire and a drive of a whiskey producer to access as much of that oak character as possible correct. in the maturation. But that's not um, the case for sherry pr production, right? Well, that's exactly where I was going to come on to. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we've got to remember that um, the first thing to say is that when you walk into a beautiful, and I was in Jerez last year, and you walk into a, uh, 
you know, a wonderful, you know, bodega and, and you taste some wonderful sherries and you see some wonderful Soleras and you look at the, the Soleras, the bottom row and the, the Criaderas above it and you take a third out and it gets this sort of active system. It is not an interactive maturation system. It is a biological or it is a oxidative aging system. Yes. So sherry is matured by air or lack of air, yes. depending on which sherry you're trying to produce. So the, 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 the key thing about that is that the Solera casks, which are these, you know, very, very old casks, which are simply vessels to hold sherry. They are not interacting with the sherry at all. They are not doing anything to the sherry. They are all American oak. So they're imported American into Spain oak. and have they, been they for many years. They would be choosing American oak because of its ability to cooper a very tight, high integrity cask that's yes. very durable, right? Correct. And, 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 and a Solera system we can liken to layers. Yes. Um, and if you imagine, I know that practically it's not always like this, but if you imagine the top layer having the newest sherry in it, um, That's right. the, the layers being more and more mature as it goes down, and they bottle half the most mature layer, let's say the bottom layer, and a then they fill it. it. A third. Sorry? A third, a is third it? Of it? A yes, third of it. A third of it. Fantastic. Yes. And then they cascade that liquid down through the Solera system and top up at the, the top the mature sherry. Correct. Um, and we know we, we're probably exposed a wee bit to the concept of how Soleras might work because there are some even Scotch single malt Solera products out there that you can buy that's using a very similar maturation style. Yeah. Um, so that's interesting. But so if we go back then, even back when it was very expensive and very difficult to get American oak to build these Solera systems, the Spanish, the Europeans had worked out that that was the the best place to get it because of the integrity of the wood. So these original Solera systems, most of the time, are actually American oak. Uh, absolutely, yeah. And in, in any experience that I've been in a Solera when I was in Jerez, they were all American oak. So um, that just shows you that the, you know, these casks and that, you know, they're not a lot of them are not as big as sherry butts either. They can be smaller casks than that as well. So um, the these this system is is an active living system and yes. so the availability of these casks is non-existent now and, and always has been very limited to be honest um and actually in terms of making great scotch whiskey they may not actually deliver what we're looking for in a modern scotch whiskey which is or we're looking for which is flavor um and color obviously from from the from the oak because they they can be dead they can be relatively dead they're not interactive and you have to imagine yeah that after a hundred years of of holding sherry that the the oak has become pretty tired pretty it's, it's done it's it's thing little by little over the years and you wonder about yeah. even if you could get your hands on these really valuable really old casks you know, how successful a maturation for scotch would they be? Maybe not so much. If we are indeed driven by that desire to access uh, the compounds and the flavours in the oak, there's not going to be a lot left in those old Excelera casks, I guess, right? No, no, absolutely not. And so you then, you know, you have that sort of uh, position where, um, you know, you have this this cask which, you know, is 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 integral to making really good quality, whether it be Fino or um, Oloroso or Pedro Jimenez, um, and 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 the the sort of bodegas are going. Well, I'm not going. To, you know, these are not available. This is this is my lifeblood. This is what I do. So, um, you know, there's a huge issue with that. And obviously, very occasionally, some of them do become available and have been used, as you have said. Um, and um, but but I mean. I don't, you know. But even then, it wouldn't be. It'd be a very, It'd be the exception rather than rule. This was not a traditional thing. It would be very rare to uh, to appear for these things to appear. So let's 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 move on from that then. So we've got a situation where the sherry is produced in the Solera system. The Scots, the the British, they want to drink this anywhere that's going to be shipped to across mm -hmm. Europe. They have to. Let's say pre nineteen eighties when they were still shipping bulk. They yeah. would have to ship, and I guess that they would choose barrels they would they would have barrels coopered for that very purpose tell us about those those casks. yeah they would and 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 it was down to a cost thing 
um, and yeah, European oak. Everything is. European oak. Well, the, the Spanish are like the Scots to a certain extent. Um, yes. And the Spanish oak was cheaper to create. They could create these trans bigger transportation casks, um, which would arrive in the docks, as we said, in Bristol or in uh, even Glasgow or in, uh, in, in London or wherever, or Southampton. And these casks, they would be taken off to be to go with the, the sherry would be taken, the cast would effectively be, be useless after that. And the, that's where the, they wouldn't even be shipped back because it wasn't worth doing. Um, okay. Okay. So these casks were available for um, Scotch whiskey distillers who, who obviously like all things, like all, you know, tried them. Oh, this, this, this works. This is good. Um, I imagine back then it would have been virtually free. Pretty much. Yeah. Certainly different to what they are now, let me tell you, but yes. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, but then in the 1980s, yeah, the whole thing changed. Everything is uh, overnight turned on its head. Tell us about what happened. Pretty similar. Yeah, I mean, it was basically the you know as as we see with more and more of these protective uh, rules come in as you know stone away black pudding must come from stone away and Parma ham must come from Parma. Well, sherry had to be bottled in in Spain. Had to be bottled in. In Jerez had to be bottled in, in, in its country of origin. And uh, that immediately transformed the landscape for these transportation casks. And these European oak transportation casks oh, didn't quite disappear overnight, but they were uh, the availability of them were, were, were very different. And that's where the whole thing changed. So then, then there, there has to be a different dynamic then, because very quickly the supply of these casks are going to dry up. And Scotch whiskey by this time, okay, in the 80s, they're already starting to get their feet wet, so to speak, with ex-bourbon cask maturation. Okay, that's yeah. got a lot to do with, with the sheer volume of maturing whiskey being produced back then. But they've got to come up with another way of maintaining this genre, the style of whiskey that's been created through through these dynamics. What And what did they do at this point? Well, this is where the, this is where the industry started to... To look at creating their own casks, um, in uh, and really looking at the uh, way that we could, you know, have a supply of similar type casks, either European oak or American oak, because there was American oak imported into Spain, as we know and has been for years, to to allow us to have our own supply that we have more control of of sherry casks, um, uh, whether that be Oloroso, mainly Oloroso. I think mainly when you hear the hear the phrase sherry sure. cask in a, in, in a Scotch whiskey discussion, you can pretty much say it's probably Oloroso unless it's more specific, um, which is a great sherry, obviously, for a season yes. cask. Um, that's how the, the current situation started to arise in terms of um, the Scotch whiskey industry creating their own casks from Spain. So um, you, you would contract bodegas in Spain then, to and much like they were creating transport casks back in the day or whatever, but you would be contracting them to to make a, a cask much in the same way, but obviously they can't transport the, the product in bulk. So you're then specifying that they fill those casks, correct, and and imitate then something that's been happening uh, traditionally in a transport logistics sense for years. I think imitate is a is an, it's not possibly the word I would use it's more a, a sort of improve upon uh, improve upon I think would be a good a good view I mean I think the key thing here is that you know certainly I can only speak for what we produce what we use at Glengoyne and Tandu but our casks are specified by us from the from the not potentially the tree because there's a lot of limitations on the tree but certainly the period of production the length of seasoning the length of toasting the size of casks all these sorts of things come into our specifications of what we want for Tamdu and Glengoyne and, and and that's how that works and and you know it, so you're specifying whether you want American oak or European oak to a certain extent yes and, and of course I know that you've got to work with all the um you, you're very much re restricted in terms of the supply of that because um certainly European oak is scarce um oh, yes, but yes. even there's restrict there's sustainability restrictions on American oak I guess there is. I mean, you only need to look at, I mean, if you, even if you look in a very simple way at the cost of bourbon casks, which is American oak, whether it's, you know, um, they have gone up a lot in the last few years. I think the other thing to be aware of is that there's also a huge um, 
you know, but the bourbon industry is using more and more casks than it ever has done because it's now in a much more premium position than it ever has been. 20 years ago, bourbon was nowhere near in the position it is right. now. Exactly. Um, yeah. So the quality of bourbon and the quality of the offerings of, of bourbon are, 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 are huge. And they obviously can only use the cask once. So these casks yeah. from a ex bourbon cask perspective are then sold to Canada, Japan, everywhere these days. Yeah. So, um, so that's taking up more and more demand, and there's more and more bourbon and craft distilleries using lots of lots of bur American oak bourbon casks, which does have an impact on the American oak availability coming into Europe for the production of sherry casks as well. Um, but um, the key thing is that they are very, very different styles of whiskey. An American oak, we all know how bourbon style is vanilla, citrus, and sort of lactones and coconut and those types of flavors. And a lot of people think all sherry casks are, as you said earlier, raisins, dark chocolate, spice. But actually, there's a huge diversity between a European oak Oloroso sherry cask it and sounds an American like oak one. A perfect moment to grab two clean glasses. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and introduce a... Uh, thank you so much for sending this because this no, is no, something no. I simply not many of us could buy something like this to do this kind of comparison. It's very cool, um, and uh, we have here. Uh, these are both Tamdu, right? I think they're Tamdu. Uh, I'm are not, they not that sure. I haven't tasted them yet, so I'm not. They, they, I'm not. All sure right, okay. Not, but anyway, okay. <laughs> these are both um, twelve-year-old malt whiskies at cast strength. One yeah. is from American oak. And one's from European oak. Yeah. Um, so it's the same distillate at the same age. And if we flip it around and if I show people here the difference in color is the first thing that appearing straight away. Um, yeah. You can clearly see the darker color of the European oak uh, bottle. Is, and just as a yeah. side note as well, I noticed that the, the American oak over the same amount of years has kept uh, three or so points higher ABV. Tighter oak, maybe. There's a lot of maybe. variables, but yeah, sure, sure. A lot of variables, but uh, yeah, I mean, it is a bit. You know, the American oak is one of the best casks that you can you can make. You can produce whiskey in from a cask sort of integrity and uh, point of view. I mean, I uh, remember uh, speaking when I was working for Suntory, and we, we they speak a lot with the use Mizunara casks from Japan. Yes. Uh, Mizanara is the most leaky type of oak you can possibly ever want to use. And, uh, you know, you, they, empty, they're turning up at these very old Mizanara casts, half empty and things like that. American oak's great. European well, I've, oak. I've heard the same the said about Scottish oak and Glengoyne, were, Glengoyne released a Scottish oak at yeah. one time, which couldn't have been easy, right? No, I don't think it had. I think that was a I, – I wasn't there at that point, but I think there was quite a lot of challenges involved in that, yeah. Well, I've poured these two um, – uh, and into these two glasses are poured similar kind of sized measures and we can still see the color difference in the glass perhaps not yeah. as marked uh, this is the american oak the lighter one and this darker one with the logo on the glass here is the european oak yeah. so um i guess without going into this with any kind of preconception just yeah. a, a bit of a nose and things as we as we talk through things i'm realizing that i'm i'm, I'm ignoring the 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 bar flies i'm ignoring the lounge a little bit here um, but I don't have a moderator tonight, unfortunately, so I'm going to have to try and wing it and do it myself. Tony Evans is saying, I understand that the sherry industry has thrown away the contents of the casks just to fuel the whiskey industry demands for casks. We're, he's asking if you can confirm that. I think we're going to touch on that very soon. Uh, Luna Aaron is saying, what would your guests say the main difference between American and European oak? I think we can cover that right now, especially we've got a very practical uh, demonstration. Um, of yeah. course... We, we can't share the flavors and the smells with everyone, yeah. but we'll do our best to articulate it to you. Uh, sure. Multi Manolo is and he's saying, I was uh, I always thought American oak was used because they are cheaper. European oak grows slower compared to American. Um, well, there is a little bit of that, I guess. It's much easier to cooper. There's much more of it. A European oak does grow slower and it's more knotted, um, but it's also um, much uh, more tightly under conservation restrictions hugely, as well, I think. Hugely, yeah, hugely. When we were there um, last year, we, we actually cut down a tree, which was quite an emotional, I have to say, quite emotional. Um, you see this tree, 100 yes. years old, comes down, and um, 
as it comes down, you're like, oh, look at that tree falling, a big, I mean, a huge thud. Uh, and you go and sort of, uh, you sort of walk along the length of this tree and you're like, this is incredible. And and there's water coming out the end of it and you're like, yeah. oh, isn't great. And you're like, oh, you feel a little bit guilty. Wow, I that's quite poignant. I never actually considered that. But well, I, I mean, never, it, yeah. It's, yeah it's, I never considered it in the sense of whiskey, but certainly when I do see trees being felled, it is a feeling that I've, I can rec I can identify yeah. with. I have felt it in the past. I've never considered it with oak. And I guess yeah, that even in whiskey, the context of whiskey, the, the most raw state that you see, the timber would be in stacked staves as they're air drying, let's say. That's right. You don't really see what the trees had to give up. I guess the only thing, me trying to be the positive and romantic side of me again, coming out again, is that tree is going to impart so much of its life on whiskies uh, um, and I guess other products right across the globe going forward for many, many years to come, which is a nice way to think about it, rather than it just becoming perhaps firewood. Um, I suppose you could argue if it was a nice piece of furniture, it could do the same thing. Yeah, look, I mean, the, the other thing is, of course, is that you, when you're making casts, you need the straight bit of the trunk. And depending on where the tree's been, if it's there's not that much straight bit. So you may only get a cask and a half from a tree. Um, wow. um, and the other wood is not wasted. Let's be very, very clear here. It is used in other bits of a whole load of other industries and things like that. But uh, for cask manufacture, you need staves that are, you know, at least, you know, sort of 80 centimeters to 101 meter 20 plus long um, to make our hogsheads and make our sherry butts, et cetera, et cetera. So the difference yeah. in these two, just nosing them, Gordon. Very different, totally different incredible yeah in a blind tasting i challenge anybody to even suggest that the abvs are similar the ages are similar uh, we're yeah. not just speaking about aroma um i'm speaking about just how the whiskey is communicating is really really different night and day night and day and then that i think there's a bit of an element sometimes that people go oh well it's a sherry cask and 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 because that's and, and and people's perceptions of a sherry cask are well it's this particular flavor or it's a sherry bomb or whatever but actually the nuances are hugely different when you bring in the two different oak types first fill refill all the and the cask sizes as well the different casks there's a huge diversity and that's what we focus on at tamdu and glengoyne Fantastic, absolutely fantastic. I'm I'm also going to gam. I think maybe these are Glen Goyne to me. And just just nosing, you don't know, you're not sure. Um, no, I think I think you might be right. Yeah. Okay. Um, I had it just there's a familiarity there. Yeah, I think. Um, I and uh, I know that um, one of the notes I remember at a tour. A long time ago at Glen Goyne, I, the amount of times I've toured Glen Goyne is beyond a joke. I think I could probably uh, host a tour there myself. But I remember someone asking uh, us to, to look out for a leather note. I wonder mm -hmm. if that's something that you'd be familiar with. Um, but I, I'm not sure if it was leather that I was getting, but the glass that I was nosing at the time, I identified with leather. And that's what I'm picking up, actually, in this, this European oak. Yeah. Which is it's the only thing that's it does feel quite familiar. It's making me suggest that this could be Glen Goyne that I'm, I'm smelling right now. Uh, Reb yeah. Mordecai is here. Um, he's over in Israel and he's asked a couple of questions. And uh, I think the subjects that he's discussing, and there's often a lot of kind of misunderstanding and there's kind of rumor about it. But one of the questions he's asking is, How much liquid is in the cask when it arrives with you? Is it all are they always quite dry? Do they ship wet? Is there sherry sloshing around? And his follow-up question is, what do they do? Do they discard that and rinse the cask? What happens? Can you tell us a wee bit about that? Well, obviously... From the perspective you have... of you guys, of course. No, no, of course. Well, I mean, look, we all, you can't have any sherry slopping around in the cask when you fill it with spirit. That is, uh, that's not allowed. That's not how it works. Yeah. So really what you're working on is, the, is the, the amount of sherry that's in the wood that has been taken up by the wood. Now, when you transport, um, it is pretty much the case that there will be an element of sherry in there to just keep it wet, keep it moist enough to be transported the time that it takes to get from, um, to get from Hareth to Scotland. Um, yeah. and, and then, of course, you know, 
our casks are are then filled effectively dry. Uh, you know, if you know what I mean. Um, and I think that's a really, really big point. The key point, the other thing that's very interesting is actually once the sherry, and I, saw, I just mentioned earlier, once the Oloroso sherry that, that, that we use is officially approved Oloroso sherry from within the sherry triangle, uh, yep. it's in there for about two years seasoning these casks. And um, uh, after that, that sherry can either be reblended to make to be reused um, it can be any ages between sort of three to seven. You know, it varies. It's interesting. Um, uh, or it can be used into turned into brandy or vinegar or all these other things. So, so it's not just thrown away. It's it, it is used either again, depending. You know, you probably get a spicier sherry out of a European oak cask than you will do out of an American oak cask after two years and but they can re-blend it again with younger sherries because that's how sherry works and um they can reuse it to season or it will be it will be you know it, it's not our sherry it's it's their sherry so it sounds like while there is the possibility that at some point some sherry will be discarded it's certainly not a case of sherry uh fill a, a cask is filled with sherry and then it's immediately thrown away because I think that when people think about that dynamic, that's what tempts them to think about, well, they must be making lots of tons of cheap sherry then if they're just filling and throwing away for yeah. seasoning. But what making, you're actually talking about there is a very careful process. No, making sherry, firstly, making sherry is not a cheap process. So, um, I mean, I think the first thing to be very realistic of is if, is if, and a lot of people go, well, what's, what is the spec of the sherry? And, you know, it is yeah. not realistic to be able to produce the amount of casts that we need using 30 year old sherry that's not that's just not how it works and it's not how it would ever be financially beneficial for actually anybody whether it be the end consumer or us as a producer sure, sure. so what we're looking to do is to spec fantastically you know good quality oloroso sherry produced by fantastic bodegas throughout the area who who will then put it into our cast we work with certain cooperages who actually work most of this for us um, we work with Tavasa and one or two other cooperages who who know what our specification is. They know what we're looking for, um, and it works on the basis very simply that when that cask arrives at Glengoyne or Tamdu, um, and it drops off the back of the trolley uh, of the lorry, and we smell it, and it doesn't smell right, it goes back, and that's the that's as, that's the sort of level of trust there is in this relationship. So I guess uh, that's important to make note of as well, because we're, what we're talking about here is not just oak and any old oak, because that's what the SWA says. What we're talking about here is you know that that is one of the most vital parts of you putting together the best malt whiskey that you can. So all the care that you've taken over your barley selection, you know, your 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 production of the, the how you specify your malt, uh, all your process in terms of fermentation, distillation, all of that is rendered redundant as soon as you put it into a, a bad or lesser quality cask yeah and when, any cask, when, yeah you know you guys you don't do a lot of contract filling i imagine now you've you're moving and moving and moving more and more to the to the market of malts for malt's sake you're you're preaching to the enthusiast and the connoisseur the people that want a very nice malt whiskey and that being the case you have to be very careful about what kind of casks that new make is poured into? Any responsible producer, in my view, would be the same. Um, yeah. uh, and most of them are hugely responsible. But my, you know, when you use natural color and you use age, like we do in a lot of our products across- And that's, an, that's an interesting thing to state. I don't mean to interrupt, but Glen Goyne does not often state on the labeling natural color. We, we understand it to be natural colour. If you take a tour there, we're told that it's natural colour. Mm -hmm. But you're saying it's the same at Tamdu as well. It's natural colour, right? Correct, yeah. And that's why that's why if you look at Tamdu, let's take Tamdu for a second. Tamdu only uses sherry casks. So it only uses American or European oak, and it only uses Oloroso sherry casks. So the four, there's, there's five variables that come into it in a way. There's American oak. Oloroso sherry cask, first fill, refill. Uh, European oak sherry cask, first fill, refill. So you've got four variables. And the fifth variable that sits in the background a little bit is the size of these casks. 
And that's yeah. how we make every single TAM do. Now, at Glen Goyne, for example, our 12-year-old actually has a little bit of first fill bourbon in it. So we do use a hint of bourbon at Glen Goyne, but it is still a very heavily sherried whiskey if you look at the 18, 21, 25. Okay, okay. And and how many times when we talk about I mean we're we're quite familiar with um you had a first fill Glengoyne twenty five year old I remember mm -hmm. uh, the teapot dram is you you do uh, talk at length about how despite that being a younger whiskey uh, depending on the batch you know eight ten eleven years that kind of age teapot right yeah <laughs> look at the color of it look at the color of it you make a play on that being first fill right we um, do yeah and so let let's ask that question because. Um, it's nice when we talk about first fill. It's nice when we talk about, you know, a kind of fresh refill. But how many times, I guess it varies by cask to cask, but is there a difference between American oak and European oak, how many times you can refill a cask? Oh, it's a real, there's no, there is no exact science to this. And as, as I always say, you know, a, a refill is only as good as it's, a refill is, as, look, Refills are actually brilliant. They're fantastic casks. And if you go around most distillery managers in Scotch whiskey and you say to them, what's your favorite type of cask? Refill. Now, and I have probably to say, refill, refill hogshead bourbon, probably. I have to say, listen, it's wonderful that we can enjoy these really, really bold, standout uh, flavors from first fill, whether it be American oak or European oak, whether it be bourbon or sherry. Um, it's wonderful, and it really is, and it's it's great to have it. But there is nothing like a refill cask that's been left for a long time in a nice, cool, quiet spot, regardless of the wood, regardless of the. And I've I say people have heard me on this channel for a long time talking about how it's one of the best. Absolutely, uh, it's uh, you know it just the wood is it's then the workforce being, of the industry as well. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's the wood is allowed to be drowned out a wee bit by the spirit can maintain its voice a bit longer and the environment can have a play and and things so i get exactly what you're talking about here but everwind is is asked here everwind over the states he's saying aquavitae lots of market and talk about great casks how does con the consumer know if the claim is true what are the tastes associated with good casks versus third and fourth fill we are very knowledgeable we're very seasoned uh consumers everwind i think all of us in here and we might not know or be able to identify exactly the reason, but we know, even if we can't isolate in the individual flavors and aromas, we tend to know when we've got a good whiskey versus a not so good whiskey in our glasses. So I think that that's the obvious thing, but I'll put that question over to you, Gordon. How do we, is there any, is there any tells of, of when we're perhaps sipping more than, I know what the obvious answers are, uh, from a first, second fill versus a third or fourth. Well, the, well, the obvious one is 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 color. Um, yeah. You know, uh, color is the is, it, but color is color is not an indication of anything. If actually. we know and, that you're using natural color policy, right? Well, of course. Well, yeah, I mean, color is only relevant if it's you know if it's a natural color product. We know that. Um, um, and um, so, so I mean, I think it's it's. It's where you come to, um, you know, understand something that, that that can be matured for eight years in a first fill sherry cask is going to be big and or European oak is going to be big and rich on those European oak flavors because you because the color and interaction comes in the first few years. Um, actually, if you ever go to Glengoyne, there's a wonderful display that shows you how the color actually starts to tail off as you get older and as you lose volume in the cask and you get more air and you get more oxidation going on so um color right. generally comes pretty quickly in a in a in a whiskey um so um uh you know it doesn't linearly go up with color so in terms of a refill um refills are fantastic and can be you can refill casks three three maybe three times depending on how long the first two fills were um yep. and they generally i think just don't they interact slower? They don't interact as aggressively. They they allow the spirit to change. They allow the spirit to showcase itself a little bit more. So, it, it, it's it's color color is a good indicator, and you can get refill sherry casks that are the color of like a refill bourbon cask. I mean, they look really light, but they're still wonderful in flavor. So, um, tasting is ultimately the <laughs> sampling and trying it is the best way to do it. Have you got have you got glasses in front of you? I do. So 
I have the two whiskies in front of me. Let's talk about the American oak one first. Yeah. If we, if we look at aromas first, and the, the one I've tasted is the American oak. Uh, so to me, on the nose, the, the American oak one was very was very butterscotchy. Yes. Um, the fruit, I would say, was more of a kind of a a sweeter fruit, or like a plum, a, a nice Correct. ripe fruit. Um, yeah. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't go bright fresh or tropical fruit, but I'd say kind of a rich like orchard fruit maybe. But plums, that's the kind of that's the kind of fruit I would say. Yeah. But sweet, but quite really. quite rounded. On on the on the European oak one, now we're we're comparing exactly the same spirit, exactly the same age, yeah. filled in a European and an American oak casks. The, on the European oak, it's coming across uh, like a dry nuttiness. There's you could yeah. almost convince yourself that there'd be a kind of dusty element here. Of course, we're talking about liquid, so to talk about dust seems bizarre. But you might yeah. get that as you know it, right? There's yeah. there, it, it's like a like a the shell of a nut or something or something dusty. Yeah, there's, there, is a, there is a bit I of kind of dry on it well. Sorry? I must get licorice on it as well. Licorice, let's see. <laughs> a little bit of that licorice. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's yeah, like a, and, a, and like a clove, like a, yeah, yeah. Like a spiced clove thing. And, and so, you, and the other thing that strikes me when we come to taste these is, is where they hit you on the palate as well. So when you drink American oak, whether it be, I get more sensation in the front palate. When I drink a European oak sherry cask, it's all at the back. Right. So that this one's this one's. I don't have any taste buds on the roof of my mouth, but this is very much playing with the roof of my mouth. There's a there's a texture yeah. here, and it's a dry texture. And I don't mean that in a negative way. This is a this is there's a dryness here, that, and yeah. from the American oak, you're getting a, a much more kind of um, a sweet kind of caramelly toffee coating thing happening yeah um but that on the european oak it's it, there's a dryness here this is uh, this is i'd love to, i'm going to keep these samples and share them with people because th this is so effective at showing the difference these these are so incredibly different mm. i think it they might are. be hard push to to even convince someone that it's the same product at the same age and the same abv yeah, I mean, there's a slight difference in ABV, but yeah, no, I mean, you know, yeah, well, yeah, exactly. And, you know, and, and, and John Glass, our master blender, has very kindly put these together for us to give us something, uh, just to show you at the same age how different they can be. Um, and, and it's a prime example. I mean, I, we released a couple of single casks in the last two years at, at Tamdu, and, and, and the first one was a distillery manager, was, was sorry, was the distillery team's cask. And they went for a big, bold, as a team, European oak, high strength, tannic dryness and, you know, wonderful whiskey. And Sandy McIntyre, who's the actual distillery manager, was, it's not his favorite. He's more American oak, Sherry. Right, but, right. So this year he had his own cask. So he picked his own one, which was an well, American I'll oak. I'll share cask. a quick anecdote based on that very theme, because I think it's relevant. But you do a really cool kind of blending class there, and I've done it a few times now. It's great fun. You get to go into the manager's uh, house there at Glengoyne and sit down with a range of samples laid out mm. in front of you. And all you have to do is blend your own little bottle to take away as a souvenir. But how eye-opening is it? Because everybody nice. sits down and they're immediately drawn to that bold, dark, rich sherry one on the right-hand side. And mm -hmm. they reach for that. And then through the process of playing in the glass, adding a little bit of this and a little bit of that, you yeah. realise how amazing it is to blend those rich, bold, heavy, first fill uh, Oloroso sherry flavours with a little bit of American oak, or even, God forbid, a little bit of ex-bourbon. Because when you're making your own malt whiskey, you're doing it to exactly what you enjoy. And I, I, I picked up a lady from Glen Goyne. Uh, she, she was on my show. We did an impromptu live on Saturday night. She'd been at that very thing. So I predicted when I was speaking to her, I said, tell me, when you made your own blend, were you happy with it? She said, oh, I'm very happy with it. It's delicious. And I said, I bet you added some um, ex-bourbon or, 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 or American oak in there at the end. You didn't just go for the European oak sherry, did you? And she said, no, I put 10% in. Because she, she realized the difference it made. It fills out the kind of gaps. It makes it rounds it out. It makes it a fuller experience. And I think yeah. that's what you're talking about there when... What? Yeah, I mean, that, 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 it, so American oak sherry is American oak as well. It's but it's it's obviously been seasoned in sherry. So 
you still get a hint of those American oak, vanillin, vanillas, and and you know those type of flavors. So I like to think of it almost in a way that if you had, if you have at one end of the spectrum a, a European oak Oloroso sherry cask, and the other end you have an American oak bourbon cask, and you've got the vanillas and the dark chocolates. American oak sherry sits somewhere in the middle of those two. Yeah, um, exactly that. There's a really interesting question there from Ingve Brunswick, and he's asking, do you always buy casks from the same producers or is it auction-based? I guess that um, Inga hasn't had the opportunity to tour Glengoyne because there's a really nice video that you guys show at the start of the tour that talks about that very thing. Yeah. And I will say with my patrons, I shared a video a couple of days ago, um, which was a nice, a really nice video, which you have a starring role in, Gordon. A really nice video, obviously very Tamdu focused but it's called From, uh, from Spain to Speyside, right? Yeah. Um, and it talks about this very thing and the relationship you have with the producers. But I'll let you take Inga's question. Do you buy auction or do you have agreements in place? No, no, no. We we, we have agreements with um, with the three main cooperages that we work with. in, And we, they're mentioned in this video. Um, Tavasa. Um, um, and uh, we also work with Huberto Demek in... Uh, and Vasima as well. So we work with three producers who are, they're all family run businesses and so are we. So um, there's a lot of trust there and understanding and we generally get American oak sherry cast from one and you know, European oak from another. And um, but, but I mean, what's interesting when you go there and you see this film is you, it, it's an exceptionally heavy, it, it's, an, it's a very heavy industry in terms of people. It's 90 people will make, or certainly 70, 80 people will make 90 to 100 casks in a shift. Wow. That, that, that's, uh, that's, that's the sort of... So uh, basically, so if you multiply give or take, that up, it, takes, it takes one man to make one cask one day. Pretty much. Pretty much. Pretty much. And, and that just tells you why they are now, the price they are, but also far less just there's a whole range of other factors. And it's a, from our perspective, we work on a six year process it's two and a half years of air drying and about two plus years of seasoning and that's not everybody is that everybody some people are different but that's pretty much the industry maximum yeah when you consider that seems like a long time but the tree's been grown for 100 years plus yeah and hopefully a good quality cask is going to see um gen certainly generations if not 100 years of use right oh, some no, of these absolutely. casks can have been a, a, around for a, a heck yeah. of a long time definitely yeah. Um, and yeah. I mean, I've I've seen casks, and we've got casks in Glengoyne and Tamdu that are you know 50, 60 years old. So, um, and and so there's plenty of uh, you know good casks will be used again, you know, and and you know um, certainly uh, even back in the 60s and when I was with a with a, when I was with you know the guys before in uh, in Bowmore, I remember speaking to to Eddie McCaffer, who is the distillery manager at, at Bowmore. And he said, I remember when these 1964 casks came in, he said, I knew they were special. <laughs> um, and uh, we all know what a 1964 Bowmore was like, but it just it's sort of shows you that- three years, right? Exactly. And, and it just sort of shows you that, um, you know, even way back then they could spot a really good cask. And, and you know, we're now, you know, the quality of the cask we're getting now is much more consistent. And, but still remains very inconsistent compared to a bourbon cask. Very interesting guy to get stories like that from as well. Um, some of the stories that Eddie shared with me are not for polite airing. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic guy as well. Simon Ray saying, I love sherry cask whiskey, and this chat with Gordon is fascinating. Um, I, I think it is. I think it's. I think it's fascinating because I think what what I was hoping to do today was to kind of clear up a wee bit of misunderstanding, but prompt us to consider Mm. a little bit as we're sipping what we identify as being a sherry mature product try and and, and kind of work out if especially if we've got the beauty of a single cask like you mentioned from tamdu uh, special editions from glengoyne where like the teapot dram where we can actually identify what uh, what ratio has been american oak what ratio has been european oak maybe single cast from independent bottlers can help as well as isolate these kind of flavors but as we contemplate enjoying these sherry style whiskies consider the differences between the oak and how reliant Scotch whiskey is on the oak. Yes, of course, the incumbent or the previous incumbent uh, liquid plays a huge, huge part. But we, are, we need, in Scotch whiskey production, 
we need to get past that and access the oak as well, right? Yeah, I mean, I think we're very clear in that video that that, that, that we produced, and I think this is the key point. A link to, to that video that uh, Gordon's talking about in the description box below. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the key thing that, that, that is really important to, to, to understand is if we look back even 10 or 15 years ago, I remember hearing, oh, no, we always need to use a cast that's been used before because, or had something in it before because, you know, our delicate spirit won't be able to, I'm talking in a very general way, our delicate spirit won't be able to handle a newly charred cast, for example, from from like like a bourbon. Well, we now see virgin oak casks coming in from, uh, you know, I know there's various producers have produced a sort of virgin oak uh, scotch whiskey, single malt yeah. yeast, and I think do one and um, Ochentoshin has done one and yes. one or two others. And, and they're really spicy and vibrant and, and, and great whiskies. Um, so and even it tends, in the last it tends 15, to lend itself to being able to put a younger expression out as well because. No, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But you're going to get. But the key thing is what I'm trying to get to is that you're getting those vibrant flavors and those spiciness that remember the bourbon probably would have taken an element out of that bourbon style cask. Now, if we didn't have sherry in our casks, the two years of that sherry sitting in our casks, taking out those tannins and um, all those sort of, you know, compounds and elements that, that, that would make our whiskey quite bitter and quite almost a bit like sometimes when you taste a whiskey that's just been in a cast too long it's too much too oak you'd probably get to that point very quickly so the sherry is an essential part of modifying the oak so that it can mature our whiskey in a way that we want it to um, so, so what we're talking the about there is not just a layer of sherry and a layer of oak but actually the interaction between the two changing the oak. completely what the net effect is going to be. So if we took the whiskey and we put it into just oak that hadn't had sherry, or if we took some sherry and dropped it into some whiskey, we wouldn't see anything like the same effects. We need the oak and the sherry to interact first. Absolutely. And it's yeah. a really important, important point about, you know, we're very clear that it is, and um, you can see it here. These yes. have had the same amount of sherry in them for the same amount of time but it is the oak that makes this one lighter, this one richer, the taste difference that you have described. It is the oak and not what was in it before. And that is the, you know, it is the oak that matures whiskey. And we just, although we talk about in the industry, sherry casks and bourbon casks, actually I would love to see more American oak and European oak put on packaging to make people slightly understand that, that it's the oak that personal thing. But, um, Absolutely, it is, yeah, it is essential to it's the oak that matures whiskey that gives it its color and gives it its flavor. Of course, there's sherry in the wood, and we understand how that uh, interacts. But it's you know over a long maturation of 40, 50 years, when you taste you know very old whiskies, it's the oak that's doing the magic. It's not what was in it forty or fifty years ago, and it's the same when you, even in a ten year old whiskey. I have to say. It's a privilege to sip these two whiskies. I know they're only 12 years old. I say only 12 years is a still a very, very mature vintage or age. But they are absolutely delicious. They they're, are. They are really, really delicious. I want to keep these, and I'll find a way to – I'm maybe going to make a couple of drams here and find a way to send them out to a couple of people so they can appreciate what I've actually been able to experience here. Um this evening. Um. The, the the difference is, and, and when you combine them together in a in a single malt, you know, you yes. are combining together two very different whiskies, which is what we do throughout Glengoyne and Tamdu, is the combination of these together. And that's a well what, that's what, might, really what might be a nice thing to do would be for me to continue enjoying the contrast here and sip these down until there's only maybe a tablespoon left in each glass. Tip them together and leave them for a minute and see what happens yeah, just as a absolutely. bit of fun. Reb Mordecai is asking, um, uh, but very important to add that sherry also adds positive flavors. I think that that's what we've kind of said. Um, you know, it's very important that this, it has to be a sherry cask. It has, it has to be good quality sherry, of course, that's had that interaction going on. Um, in order to get those positive flavors. I think I think that's what we're seeing. And if you know, I guess, that you're going to 
be filling a cask with the view of making a good quality product that you're going to put your brand on that you've been building for decades, you're going to do your damnedest to make sure that it's a it's a good cask, I guess. Uh, Luna, yeah. Aaron is asking, Luna is asking, are the Scotch whiskey industry allowed to combine American European oak like an Irish whiskey? Absolutely, Luna, providing it's been made at the, on the same site. Um, yep. they, there is no legislation guiding that. They have a completely free hand. They're just vatting cast together. It still very much remains uh, yep. a single malt whiskey. Um, uh, and Reb is saying, thanks, Roy. Thanks for this VPUB. Great subject. I knew this would be right up Reb's street. Um, and uh, Scog Smart is saying, what happens to casks after they've been emptied for the last time? Can you rechar them and use them again? And also, there was a question earlier, I don't remember who asked it, but they asked your opinion, Gordon, on STR casks as well. So I guess uh, they're kind of linked to those two questions. What happens after third fill, fourth fill, when the cask is theoretically given up its last? Well, it may have had for that type of whiskey, but uh, it may well be useful for other types of whiskey. So... You know, we we still produce a lot of blended whiskey um, yep. as a business um, uh, across the scale from low to high. Um, so, you know, we have needs for oak casks. Um, and so we will still use a cask if it's got a, a little to give, um, for sure, uh, maybe to, to mature grain whiskey or something like that. And, you know, I think we spoke about this earlier, I think, uh, Personally, I, we've spoke about the, the, the tequila casks and things like that that are now being allowed to be used for casks that have held tequila in the past. And I, as I said, I don't think we're suddenly going to see a tequila finished single malt in the next few years. But I think what that is all about is using oak. If it's oak, it can be used. And, and you know, it's, I think on it's directly right. reflective of the shortage on, on oak, the, the stresses that's on the supply chain for oak right now. And I doubt very much like Glenn Goyne, Tam Du, Glenn Farkless, uh, Glenn Dronick, anybody is going to be, you know, tripping over themselves to get their hands on some ex tequila casks. But for, um, the industry as, uh, for the industry as a whole, it kind of frees up a bit of uh, pressure, I yeah. guess. I think that's the point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Kim Bright is saying, hi, Roy, I like to bar tonight. Uh, sipping a dram of Wild Turkey 101. Now, we know that that has not had anything in it before, Kevin. That's only, that's absolutely fresh. The it's first thing that was, uh, was your uh, bourbon mash. Great dram, too. Yeah, Wild Turkey, yeah. I think Wild Turkey, going from memory, is uh, rye. It's heavy. It's a rye bourbon, I think. Sure, I was speaking to speaking about that very thing to Dwayne last night. And Kresimir has just come in and said, who controls what kind of what type of casks uh, distilleries are using? Well, I would have to say as long as it's uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but as long as it's oak and it's within the definition set out by the SWA, the distilleries themselves control it down to their own personal desires, financial constraints, whatever it may be. It's the yeah. it's down to the distilleries. Yeah, absolutely. I guess on the back of what you've been sharing with us all the way through, we need to remember that there are independent cooperages out there and there's an independent cask brokerage and trade dynamic going on as well. People trade casks. Oh, hugely. Yeah, no, no. And, you know, we are, we are, you know, we're very lucky to have dedicated suppliers of sherry casks. That comes out of a history of, of, you know, the distilleries and that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, that's not all sherry casts are, you know, let's be very clear here. All sherry casts are not what I've been describing for the last 10, 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. Uh, I can only speak for what we do. Um, and, I, you know, not all sherry casts are that. And even simple things like, for example, when we store it for two and a half years with the sherry, we store it on its side. Um, other producers, other people will palletize them. And, and so, you know, you have a, it's it's the attention to detail through the whole six year process that makes our casks. I genuinely believe some of the finest in the industry, um, and that's why they are you know they're approaching fifteen hundred pounds each. Um, McCann Fine and Rare, the doc, has asked an interesting question as well. It's actually one I made a note of as well, and he's brought up the the Latin name of the the oak um, that I wanted to mention. I'd forgotten this. 
Um, he's asked about other uh, European oak types that's permitted for wine maturation, such as yeah. Quercus Petrea. Yeah. So, or Petrea, is it? Quercus Petrea, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it, it's definitely used mainly for wine casks, more in the sort of that part of the area. So it is a different species of oak and 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 produces a different style of whiskey. And 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 I I love wine matured whiskey. Um, I love wine finished whiskey for sure. But I, what I actually also find a lot of people, it's probably the most polarizing style of whiskey for a lot of people uh, because it has a distinctive sort of berry style to it, but it's got that spiciness and that sort of zesty edginess to it and that tannic. Can be quite well. tannic, right? Can be quite Very tannic. Very tannic, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, Petrea is the other one. But, I mean, I think the key thing is we still take most of our European oak from northern Spain, so from Galicia, these areas. Um, but European oak can be taken from Romania, Hungary, you know, whole, across the whole, you know, across all of Europe, effectively. So help me out, just before I read out a couple of comments, what, what am I getting on this American oak? one here because I tried to, uh, there's something here, there's a richness here that I'm not able, I, I said butterscotch, that's still there, I'm still getting that, I said a kind of plumminess, but you mentioned that you're getting licorice on the European oak one, what's your defining yeah. aroma here? I have to say, I think okay. I, the American oak is my favourite tonight. I, no, absolutely, and I think if you add some water to it, and I don't know if you have, you'll see. Oh yeah, I haven't, no, but I shall. I'll add, I mean, I'll add a drop of water to the American oak one, and I think you'll see a a huge difference to that. It'll be, become even more creamy, buttery. It'll become a bit sweeter, I think, and it'll it will reveal itself. But I I get that sort of cooked fruit dessert. There's a sort of that sort right. of crumble. So that's the, I mean, this I'm talking about. It's like it is yeah. like a rich cooked fruit maybe but Apple but not like raisins not like um no. not like spiced fruit but like like ripe juicy kind of cooked fruit and and maybe that's the dessert thing when i talk about the butterscotch thing that's certainly the creaminess the toffee thing yeah right, well, okay. that drop of water changes it hugely and i find when you add water to a european oak whiskey or american oak they change in different ways but that's not always the case oh. but. that's why i love it it's that mouth feel. Yeah, it becomes I, creamy. I, I always reserve the right to change my mind completely tomorrow. <laughs> but tonight, you know, the, the sherry, that rich European oak sherry is absolutely seductive, right? The spice and the nuttiness and the, uh, it really feels like a nice cozy winter dram. But this American oak one, it's it's one of my favorite things about whiskey is texture. I always talk about texture. Um, and this, Especially just with that wee splash of water in it, you've hit the nail right in the head. You're absolutely spot on. It comes, it just, it's wonderful. What? It's bizarre that adding a few drops would bring out that side of it, but it does. It always. Well, does. certainly, it, I mean, it's at fifty-eight point two percent. So a couple of drops, you'll see that change are much bigger than. I'm a great advocate of adding water to whiskey. I mean, I yes. you know, could never and, ever. And when you're putting in a couple of drops, we're not talking about dilution there. Okay. We're talking about adding water to stimulate. A change yeah. in the whiskey, just exactly. much as the way as rain falls on dry ground or something like that, just to bring out some extra um, facets of the whiskey, and it's certainly a thing. And beyond that, you can start to add water and dilute and to bring it down and bring it down and see how it affects things. But yeah. sometimes just a few drops, like I've done here, a tiny wee scoosh, um, completely changes the whiskey altogether. Ebhead is saying, really interesting to listen. Great guest, Aquavita. I'll probably need to see this again to store all the information. Fantastic, Rolf. Fantastic, you're enjoying it. Neil Cochran saying, Aquavita, this is great. So people are clearly enjoying the discussion, and that's wonderful to hear. I'm very happy about that. Noticing that we're getting on for time, we always seem to burn through time. Like it's, I don't know how it feels at your side. Um, but uh, uh, usually, as you know, you've participated in the quiz at the end in the past, Gordon. Um, if you've got the time, I'll yeah, uh, sure. you to hang out with us and enjoy the quiz at the end. Yeah. Oh, well, um, definitely. Yeah, it's, there's not a lot of themes that I've covered during this stream. I haven't. This hasn't been a, like a listen and you. There's a test later. Don't worry. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, we're going to. Um, try a, a wee kind of fun. It's a bit eclectic tonight, if I'm honest. That's my feeling of it right now. Uh, Mark Slinger is saying, Aquavite, uh, 
Roy, this has to be in your top three videos of all time. <laughs> what about that? That's praise indeed, Gordon. Thank you so much, Mark. Christine Daisy is saying definitely a top-notch VPUB. Wonderful stuff. It's certainly a wee bit better than listening to me monologuing for uh, hours at a time. Not at um, all. You're very good at it. My uh, my friend over in Germany, uh, Whiskey Jason, is in. Um, know, I've been looking Jason. out for a couple of comments from him, but he might be able to help me run the quiz tonight since I don't have a moderator in. Maybe, Jason, you'll act as my uh, moderator in chief, my friend and help me start off the quiz. Anybody that's willing to stay for the quiz, if it's your first time and you haven't been for the quiz before, don't be frightened off by it. It is tough. The lounge here is full of very knowledgeable whiskey folk and it's difficult to keep them on their toes, but it's multiple choice. So even chimpanzees have a chance of getting uh, the questions right um, a third of the time. So it's just for fun. You're only playing against yourself. There's no um, prizes or anything. But as I talk about prizes, um, Gordon has very kindly donated a very, very nice gift. Thank you so much. He sent down uh, this uh, 100ml 10cl bottle of 21-year-old Glen Goyne. I've got plenty of the stuff over my shoulder. Anybody that listened to my end-of-year pub, uh, V-pub last year when I was uh, talking about 2018 will know how much I love that 21-year-old. But I'd like to give this away to somebody that's watching tonight and that has stayed until this point in the VPUB. So have you got a question, Gordon, that you think you could throw out there and we'll give it to the first barfly that can answer? Oh, um, yeah. Um, oh, that's, a, that's an interesting one. Yeah, I think we could probably come up with something. What is the, um, what is the Latin name for both European and American oak. So we want the first person to give us clearly the Latin name for European and American oak. We'll get themselves a wee 10 CL. Now, if you don't want this, don't answer, please, because it will come to you. Um, but if you uh, feel that you would like to get your hands on a delicious Glen Goyne 21, um, answer. Uh, Skippy Van Pobbe is saying P something. Uh, Alexandru is saying Quercus. Yes, that's the, what would that be, the genus? Um, Skogsmard is saying Quercus, is, but I think you're looking for both, right? And yeah. we've got uh, Servus Elafis has come in and said Quercus Alba and Quercus Robur. That's Andreas in Norway. I think he's the first guy to answer. I don't know if you see the chat, Gordon. Maybe it's the same at your side as well, but I think Andreas has just snagged himself a 10CL bottle of Glengoyne 21. Oh, Congratulations, go. Andreas. Um, I don't know if you're coming over here for the Glasgow Whiskey Festival, but if you're not, no worries. Email me and I will send you across your Glen Goyne 21. Uh, just quickly on emailing me, if there is anyone out there that, that gifted me a bottle while I was in Texas, um, I'm thinking of Joy and uh, Brian. I'm thinking of uh, Eric. I'm thinking of... There was just so many people. Just look over my shoulder. I was given so many gifts. If you gifted me something... I now have something in my possession that I would like to give back to you. Please email me, whiskey at aquaviti.com, and give me your up-to-date address. I would like to send you something back as a thank you. I hope I need to put it out in social media as well so that I can get the word out to people. If you gifted me uh, one of those fantastic bottles in the States, I would like to give you something back. I'll warn you at the outset, it's not a bottle of whiskey, <laughs> but it's a nice, uh, hopefully a nice token of thanks anyway. Fantastic. Okay, uh, I'm just looking to see if Whiskey Jason is still here. I know it's very late for him over in Germany, um, but if anybody's up for the quiz, please hang around. Um, and I will try to do my very, very best to define the answers as they come in. Gordon, thanks for staying uh, for the quiz. Well. And, uh, and thanks for giving us some such fantastic insight as well. Let's see if I can add this. What will happen if I click on this? Do you and I stay? All right. Ah, yes, we stay. So we're, we're both there. So you can play along, Gordon. I'll ask you when I ask you for your answer. Uh, don't be giving anything away too early. Um, <laughs> good luck, everybody. Remember, it's multiple choice. You're only playing against yourself. And you can answer simply just A, B, and C. And I'll try and pick out some of the answers as we go along. Jimmy Legg is pitching in. Good for you, Jimmy. Fantastic, Blair. Uh, sorry, Jimmy. Um, fantastic to have you helping out. Neil Cochran is saying Aquaviti. Big thanks to Gordon, top bloke. Uh, I agree with sentiments, Neil. Absolutely. 
Let's go. Kevin Grant is already answering A. Let's see if you're right, Kevin. Question one, which distillery, now lost, was once known as Glen Grant 2? So we're talking about a long gone distillery, but when uh, before it became known as what you're about to see here, it was known as simply Glen Grant 2. Would that have been Capardonic? Would it have been Imperial? Or would it have been Convil Moor? What was Glen Grant to A, Capardonic, B, Imperial, C, Convil Moor? Just give me a nod, Gordon, if you think you've got this one or not. Are you <laughs> guessing? Uh, well, oh, okay, good, good. Okay. It's not going well so far. Okay. So Kevin Grant um, did guess A, and he's quickly changed his mind, and he's now saying B. Sunday Evening Scotch is saying A, Alistair Gray, Spirit Wars Tom is also saying A, Mikey Hay thinks C, thinks it's Convo Moore. A wee bit all over the place, but the vast majority of you seem to be plumping for A, which would be Capadonic. Uh, Kilted Moose, oh, uh, just as it jumped there, I think Kilted Moose was going for B, which is Imperial. Um, let's see. I can tell you that Glen Grant 2 became known as... Capardonic. Capardonic. Did you know that? Sorry, Gordon, I forgot to I ask. Did, I did not know that, no. So there you, you would have guessed Capardonic? Uh, I, no, I didn't. No, I, I, so I have absolutely that's, no idea. Nice of you to be honest. Uh, I only know it because when I was over in Texas, I stumbled upon bottles of Cap Capardonic 23-year-old at 46% ABV selling for $70. Now you're talking about something that would be two, three hundred pounds over here, right? Quite incredible. Mm -hmm. And I guess that it's just that perhaps they didn't know um, in that particular store what they had on hand. I wish I had more space in my luggage to bring it back. But I looked <laughs> into Capadonic a wee bit and discovered that they were once known as Glen Grant too. Um, Imperial is now uh, gone. That's no more. Uh, Dalmunic is is built or Dalmunic, I'm not sure of the pronunciation actually, is now built on the Imperial yeah. site. And obviously Convil Moor is still standing, actually. It's in Dufton, owned by the Grants. Um, but I think it's Diageo that's still on the Convil Moor brand, so we might never see yeah. Convil Moor appear again. Question two, which of these Inverhouse brands is the best seller? This blindsided me. I'll give everybody a warning. Which of these Inverhouse brands is the best seller? We've, we've been enjoying talking about Inverhouse recently after the rebranding of Old Pulteney and Bal Blair. Um, but we want to know which of their, theirs is the best seller. We're, of course, talking about malts. Is it A, Old Pulteney from Pulteney Distillery? Is it B, Bal Blair? Or is it C, Spayburn? A, Old Pulteney, B, Bal Blair, or C, Spayburn? Uh -huh. Chad Adams thinks it's Spayburn, as does Rolf and Oliver Truavis. Mikey Hay thinks it's B, along with Gixer Skipper. Uh, so many people, including Whiskey Jason, he is in tonight. He thinks it's C, Spayburn. Uh, and Kevin Grant also thinks it's C, Spayburn. I was quite surprised by this, but I think it sh goes to show that we often drink our whis whiskey based on the perspective we have mm. from our local markets, I guess. The bestseller from Inverhouse is indeed C, Spayburn. Quite amazing. Yeah. What would you have said? I would have said C because I know Spayburn is very popular in the USA, I think. Absolutely. It's another thing that struck me when I was over there, Gordon, that the amount of Spayburn that they had on the shelves was quite eye-opening. Here, when you do see it, it tends to be a non-age statement or a young Spayburn, and it tends to be a fairly budget malt whiskey, I have to be, has, to be, has to be said. And it made me realize just how under the radar it is as a distiller. Okay. Um, but in the US, they drink buckets of it, and uh, it's uh, by a decent margin, um, Inverhouse's best seller. Quite amazing. Mm. Well done if you answered C for Spayburn, and let's have a wee look at question three. I doubt that you'll know um, much about Iron Root Gordon, but if you've got a, if you like American whiskies um, and bourbons and things like that. Uh, maybe if I bump into you at the weekend, if I'm mindful, I'll bring some Iron Root for you to try. It's quite amazing stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the new release from Iron Root is called Ichor or Ichor. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. I think it's Ichor, uh, which is what in Greek mythology is Ichor? A, the blood of the gods, 
Is it B, the fire of the gods, or C, the water of the gods? So I'm not asking you know too much, know so much about whiskey here. I suppose I'm asking folk uh, if they know anything about Greek Greek mythology, which right up until I discovered the name of this whiskey, um, and the the whiskey rev actually told me that Icor was indeed this thing. He knew what it was. Again, a few people kind of all over the place with this one. <laughs> Uh, Jimmy Legg is saying, come on, Aquavite, who knows that? Well, I guess it's not for whiskey folk, it's for folk that are into their Greek mythology. But I think it's kind of fun, Jimmy, so you'll forgive me. Most people are answering A, for the blood of the gods, with a few people thinking it's the fire of the gods. And even one or two think that it could indeed be the water of the gods. Is it a banana skin or is it indeed the blood of the gods? Let's have a look. Icor is, of course, A, the blood of the gods in Greek mythology. I keep forgetting to ask you before I reveal the answer. Would you have gone for no. A? No, I, I went. I went for the slightly whiskey orientated one because you make whiskey from water. So I went for C. C. Ah, okay, <laughs> guessing as well. I have to say, <laughs> if I didn't know the answer, I would be fully guessing in that one as well. Um, <laughs> let's see how we're getting on. There's a few people seem to be doing okay here. Jimmy Jazz is on three out of three. Scog Smart, um, not bad. Question four. You know I like to throw these in here. I know it usually gets a roll of eyes from the crowd. But which whiskey tube channel, which channel, talking about whiskey on YouTube, recently released a whiskey coin featuring a map of Texas. It's a very recent thing. Was it A, Whiskey Crusaders? B, The Whiskey Tribe? C, It's Bourbon Night? One of those channels. Now, I don't even know if you are aware, Gordon, of any of these channels. I'm aware of them. Um, but I'm Good. not. Well, Whiskey Crusaders is Matt Citric. He's out and he's based in Texas. I'm yeah. saying that now. I'm doubting it. No, he is. He's based in Texas. B is the Whiskey Tribe. It's the second biggest uh, whiskey channel now. Yeah. I think only after their sister channel, which is a Whiskey Vault. I think the Whiskey Tribe is maybe just about overtaken Ralphie now. Huge, huge community growing around those channels out there. And it's Bourbonite is a huge channel as well, talking about bourbon, of course. Mm. Uh, answers are kind of all over the place. A lot of people are favouring C for its bourbon night. But if you, I'm, I'm going to ask you to guess then, Gordon, if you've any, which of those would bring out um, a map of Texas on their coin? I would suggest it's probably A. I led you, didn't I? <laughs> and I'm a bad man. <laughs> I can tell you that it's C, it's bourbon night. It's bourbon night. I'll just show quickly and if I uh, have lost my mouse uh, I'll try to show you this here uh, I'll show you that uh, this was their first release uh, this is their Kentucky coin which was kind of cool it's got their logo in the back um, and it's got the colors the state colors of the flag and things which I think is really nice but what really struck me about these coins is um, the mottos, so they're using the Kentucky State motto for their first one, which was United We Stand and Divided We Fall. Mm -hmm. And this is the Texas one that I was referring to here. This is the Texas coin using the Texas colors, the Lone Star State, but it's using the Texas motto, which is friendship. Mm -hmm. And those two sentiments, I thought, were perfect metaphors for our whiskey community. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought it'd be quite fun to share that with you. So there you go. Um, it's Bourbon Knight's coin is, uh, has a map of Texas. Okay, Gordon, I'm going to bring up this image now for question five. Is always an, a picture of a distillery or the inside of a distillery of some such. And I'm going to let folks look at that for a wee while. That's quite a stark building to be a distillery, isn't it? And I can see from your expression that you're like me. When you first looked at that, you did not recognize it. No. I wonder if that gives anybody a clue. There are maybe a few in the lounge tonight that might benefit uh, from this image. Let's have a wee look. Give you three options. Are we looking at, now I, I don't know how to pronounce this as well, but I'll give it my best uh, shot. Zudam, which is Millstone, which is in the Netherlands, I think. Uh, B, McMira, or is it C, High Coast, which would have at one point been box, I believe. So is it A, Zudam, B, McMira, or C, High Coast? 
the knowledgeable out there will, by process elimination, work this one out. This is quite a tough one tonight, Gordon, I think, right? That is it, but it's like, if you've not been there, you're going to struggle to to know it, you know? It's that's like right, that's things, right. But uh, I'm, I'm going for a fairly educated guess. Good, good. I'll ask you just in a second. Uh, lots of people in the crowd. It's, again, it's kind of divisive. Karen Hughes is saying A. Donald Rance is saying A, but he's put a question mark there. He's admitting that he's guessing. A Whiskey Radar, A. Fubap is saying A. Thomas Elmer, good to see you, Thomas. James McGoran, A. Fantastic. Well, what, should, what would be your guess? Purely through architectural design, I think it's A. You're absolutely spot on. It is indeed Zudam, uh, which is the Millstone brand out there in Holland. So at the halfway point, if you've answered A, give yourself a point and share with me how you're getting on so far. There was a time when I felt like the questions were getting a wee bit easy. I was getting a lot of 10 out of 10s and things. Yeah. And then, um, yes, I, sometimes... I get guilt because I think maybe sometimes the questions have gone a wee bit tricky. But what, what Chad Adams is swearing, uh, I'll show, I'll share your swear word, Chad, with everybody. Um, if the chat would slow down, um, and he's only getting two out of five. Uh, sometimes I have a bit of guilt about the questions, but I always share questions that have made me stop and think. And I was thinking about Millstone recently. I've had a couple of Millstones. Good. And every one I've tried made me stop and stare. They were really, really good. And Oliver, I was hoping somebody would help. Try in between Zaidam and Zodam. So Zodam, Zodam, Zodam. Let's try that. Uh, that's my best effort, Oliver, and thanks for trying to help me out there. Let's look for who's on five out of five at the halfway point. We've got uh, Whiskey Jason. You start out in Germany, five out of five. Uh, uh, oh, you're having a night tonight, Andrea. Service of is on five out of five. Good for you. Anybody else? <laughs> Karen is saying, yes, my first correct question. One out of five. Good for you, Karen. Superb. Obviously not playing too well. You can still get a pass mark. Just get four right from here on in for uh, a pass mark. Danny is suggesting that it actually looks a wee bit like a recycling centre. It certainly looks a hell of a lot cleaner than my local recycling centre, Dan. Um, so let's move on to question six. See how we're getting on. Uh, Six Witch Distillery's next highly anticipated release will only be sold by the Dram. Now, surely this is a giveaway. Which Distillery's next highly anticipated release will only be sold by the Dram? Just seeing if anybody's going to just jump in and answer straight away. I can tell you it's, uh, the options are either A, McAllen, B, Springbank, or C, Daft Mill. I've just put my nose back in this uh, European oak one, um, and it's, it is absolutely lovely, Gordon. I'm going to put a wee drop of water in this one too. See how we got on with it. And if you look at the chat now, I don't know if you can see the chat. Not a single person is saying anything other. <laughs> and, Mill. and of course a bit of a freebie question there because I talked about it a wee bit and it's been in the news um, and all over social media channels over the last week really interesting concept um, these are going to be sold through bars uh, by the dram and I believe it's even at a fixed price and uh, Whiskey Radar is saying giveaway thanks Roy you're very welcome Whiskey Radar it is of course Daft Mill okay guys uh, question 7 uh, this is a bit obscure. Uh, German distillery Blau Maus, I think that's how, how I'm pronouncing it, has released a whiskey called Glen Watt. Now, this may not be recent. Uh, we might be talking about any time in its history, but they released, a German distiller released a Glen. Was it Glen Mouse, Glen Crow, or Glen Wolf? I did mention that it was a bit eclectic, didn't I? <laughs> Are you guessing again? I have, uh, uh, I think it might be, I have no idea, <laughs> if I'm honest. Um, I'm guessing more a B or a C than a, an A, but I'm not sure. Probably a C, I think, but I'm not sure. Really no idea. Okay, uh, this uh, German distiller, I, I don't know if the doc, McAllen Fine Rare is still in, Whiskey Jason, any of my German uh, bar flies, they'll tell me if I'm pronouncing Blau Mouse correctly or not. But I can tell you that Blaumaus released 
a bottle, an expression called Glen Mouse. <laughs> Fantastic. Now your reaction is the same reaction as mine when I read this, and I knew it had to become a VPUB quiz question. I I want to buy a bottle of Glen Mouse, <laughs> right? Yeah. I need to find myself a bottle of that. Yeah, it's it's from the name of the distillery, I guess. Mouse is German for mouse. Oh, of course. So there we go. Fantastic. Join a friend on that. Damn. Uh, Fantastic. Donald is saying, oh, snap, got it, lol. And uh, Spirit Wars Tom is saying, mouse is German for mouse, right? I think so, I believe so. Um, <laughs> and Greg is swearing. I'll let you away with a swear word. And Greg's whiskey guide is saying, don't buy it, my friend. Okay, question eight. Who has been appointed as Dr. Nick Savage's replacement at Master Whiskey Maker, as Masque Master Whiskey Maker at McAllen? Too many M's, I think, in that question. Who's been appointed as Dr. Nick Savage's replacement as Master Whiskey Maker at McAllen? Now, Nick Savage left a wee while ago, but in the last couple of three weeks, um, someone has been appointed Master Whiskey Maker. Is it Dr. Kirsty McCallum? Is it Kirstine Campbell? Or is it Stephanie McLeod? A, Dr. Kirsty McCallum. B, Kirstine Campbell. Or C, Stephanie McLeod. As I go into this uh, European Open, <clears throat> oh. a wee bit of water. It's, there's, I wonder if that water's brought a bit more spice out on the nose. Candy. I've not added water myself. Oh, wow. As I sip these, I often think of the people I would like to share them with. I would like to have them sip that and... I mean that's a that's a nice rich what there's no way, Gordon, that people would pick that out at twelve years old, would you agree? Oh no, absolutely not. I mean, you know, when you come to you know no, absolutely not. No. It's it, it tastes much more mature, I think. Yeah. Um very reminiscent of a very rich uh, uh Glendronach, I would say. Uh, I guess for obvious reasons. Yeah. It's got a dry finish, but the water has made it the, the finish even longer. It's just kind of mm. it's hanging around now. Yeah. I'm going to mix the two of these before the end tonight. Okay, let's have a wee look. McCann Fine and Rare is saying D Roy. You should let me nowhere near a blending lab, believe me. I can tell you that it is in fact B, Kirstine Campbell. I think she's uh, been in the team for a long time. I think she was responsible for Famous Grouse, but she's now a uh, master whiskey maker at McAllen. Uh, Dr. Kirstie Campbell, sorry, uh, Dr. Kirstie McCallum, of course, um, just moved. Has, has, sorry? She's just moved as well. Well, I wasn't sure if that was official, if that was out yet, but we know that she's moved on from the stale. And when I heard that, I have to admit my heart sank a wee bit, but I remain <laughs> I remain uh, confident that Distel keep bringing us fantastic whiskies. But Dr. Kirsty McCallum, it is said it's not been officially announced that she has moved on. Um, and of I, course, it was on her Facebook, so I can I can I can give you an exclusive if you want to know. Oh, she did put it on her Facebook, did she? Yeah, no, definitely. I haven't spoken to her, so I can only find out through sources. She's, I believe, gone to Glen Murray. Wonderful. I have not met Kirsty yet, and if you've ever, if you've watched me long enough, Gordon, you may have picked up just how much I love the product that Deanston have been putting out, and Distel in general, I have to be honest. Lechick, I absolutely adore. Um, I enjoy very much Buna Haven, um, and I, I often felt that the stuff, the building blocks that Ian McMillan put down 18 years ago or so, when he made the wholesale changes, um, the girls there, uh, Julianne Fernandez and uh, Kirsty McCallum, were able to put together some fantastic whiskies and presenting them well um, and putting them out at reasonable prices to really engaging whiskies. And I was always nervous that if I did meet Kirsty, I wouldn't just politely and professionally shake her hand. I'd give her a big kiss as well. <laughs> just mm -hmm. the amount of moments that she's given me with whiskies over the years. But there you go. Kirsty Campbell is now the whiskey maker at McCallum. It's going to question nine, second last question. Which of these non-Indian, now that's the key here, non-Indian brands is the global bestseller. So out of the top five 
Four of them are Indian whiskies, and I think out of the top ten, I think about six or seven of them are Indian whiskies. But we're specifically speaking about these three bland brands. Just tell me which of these three is the global best seller. Is it A Johnny Walker? Is it B Jim Beam? Or is it C Jack Daniels? Of course, we're not talking about a specific expression. We're not talking about old number seven Jack Daniels. We're not talking about Johnny Walker Red Label. We're not talking about Jim Beam White. We're talking about um uh the brand as a whole. You feeling confident about that one, Gordon? Or I would hope so. Okay. Yeah, I'm pretty confident. It's always a surprise when you see these figures because, as I mentioned earlier in this uh, quiz, we tend to view things through our consumption, uh, our yeah. market, the things that we can buy. And when yeah. you start to travel, you start to notice things. And when you look into it, it can be quite eye opening. Yeah. Okay, this is all over the place. Everybody's uh, all over. <laughs> um, let's see. Tim Allett. Good to see you, Tim. Kevin Grant. Uh, Karen. James McGoran. And anyone else? Anyone else? Yeah, Scott Mills. Ingve Brunswick. And Spiritworks Tom are all saying A. And I can tell you it is indeed Johnny Walker A. Was that what you'd have guessed? I see you nodding. Yeah, I mean, I, I knew that it definitely wasn't B because I'm having worked for Jim Beam, I knew that it didn't sell as much as Jack Daniels, and I was pretty confident Johnny Walker sold a lot more than Jack Daniels. So Yeah, it's quite amazing. It's quite amazing because if I go into my supermarket, there'll be two Johnny Walker expressions on the shelf, and there'll be at least three Jack Daniels expressions, and they'll have a lot more stock on the shelves, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I think in, in the UK, and exactly what you're saying, I think the UK, Jack Daniels was very close to being number one whiskey. In fact, even maybe was number one whiskey in the UK middle of last year for a while, but it's now famous grace, obviously, because it's had a, there's been that, uh, they've had that taxation increase on bourbon. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's I, I imagine it, that it would be, certainly for so many people that I speak to and they kind of, as you, as you mix and whiskey circles and events and things like that. So many people admit that the first whiskey was indeed a Jack Daniels and probably mixed with a Coke or something, right? Or ginger ale or something. Um, yeah, absolutely. We all drank it for a while. <laughs> but glo globally, the king um, of non-Indian, and it's amazing, there are four brands mm. selling more than Johnny Walker and they're all Indian brands as well. Um, yeah. So a few people are a wee bit upset with that. A few people, <laughs> exclamations coming out. But we've got Whiskey Jason, still on 9 out of 9. Alistair Gray's on an excellent 8 out of 9. James McGoran on 7 out of 9. Mark Slinger, 6 out of 9. Tim O'Leary, 7 out of 9. I'm looking for any other 9 out of 9s. Neil Cochran having a bad time. Now, he was on a, a great run for a while and got a couple of 10 out of 10s, but he's on 5 out of 9 tonight. Just goes to show that it's a bit of a tricky one. Spirit Works Tom is saying 9 for 9. I think that's my best yet. Good for you, Tom. Definitely a good score. There's Graham Young on 8 out of 9. Fantastic, Graham. That's a great one. Um, let's see if the 9 out of 9s can hold on for question 10. See what this is like. Who introduced a hand grenade-sized miniature in 2005 called La Bombette? I can see Graham putting his head in his hands. <laughs> So we're looking at, we're talking about a mini here, a whiskey mini. It was actually a wee bit bigger uh, than the usual size. It was a 10 CL, so it was about the size of the bottles we were pouring from. But it was shaped like a hand grenade, and they called it affectionately, if you can call something a hand grenade affectionately, La Bombette. Was it A, Tormor, B, Glenrothes, or C, Highland Park? I think you've just been thrown a lifeline by seeing the three options, Gordon, maybe. I'm not sure. Oh, no. <laughs> James McGoran saying, I saw this. Um, I have to picture it. It's Glenn Rothis. Chad Adams thinks it's Glenn Rothis. Uh, lots and lots of people saying B, Mikey Hay thinks, and Kevin Grant both think it's Tormor. Um, Gabriel Wilding is saying B. What would you guess? I would guess B, but. Um, is yeah, there any not, not confidently. Sorry? Sorry? Is there any rationale behind you guessing B? Yeah, I'm only going by, I mean, I can picture it, but I think it's more related to the bottle shape. So I'm, I'm going more B. Most of the most of the lounge, most of the barflies are agreeing with you and they're going for B. And I can tell you that absolutely they're right. And this is, Thank of you. course, based on the idea that... Um, 
uh, Glenrothes, the famous dumpy shaped bottle that Glenrothes adopted about, I don't know, it must be about 20 years ago, is affectionately called La Bomba because of the shape of it. And when they brought out this miniature, they called it La Bombette. So um, I can understand why some people would have thought Termoa, and that's why I put that in there because the vintage uh, bottlings of Termoa was, uh, especially the export market ones, had that very distinctive uh, uh, bottle styling that made it look like a large hand grenade and that was actually called the five-year-old turmoil was actually called the hand grenade um but yeah the answer i was looking for tonight in question 10 was glenn rothis so if you answer b give yourself a point and let me know how many of you did anybody make it through and manage a 10 out of 10. i always kind of duck at this point because i sometimes get um not even uh, Steve A, fantastic Steve, that's a great score, 9 out of 10. Brilliant Alistair Gray, 9 out of 10. He managed to answer the last one as well. I'm looking to see if there's any 10 out of 10s. Did anybody make it tonight? Sometimes I miss it when they do. You can tell me if you spot it. Whiskey Jason in Germany is celebrating. He got a 10 out of 10. Well done, Jason. Fantastic score. Whiskey Jason, of course, has a channel of his own. He does a channel in German and a channel in English. Um, Fantastic for a, a 10 out of 10. Whiskey Dodie, George Braley is also saying, well done all at 10 out of 10, but I don't think he got it himself. He's just saying congratulations. I'm looking to see if anybody else managed that tonight. Tim Allett is saying he scraped a past. Spiritworks Tom, Tom did get 10 out of 10. He's saying my first 10 ever, so he's celebrating too. Fantastic. Gordon, thank you so much for staying on and enduring, enduring. <laughs> <laughs> The quiz. Um, I didn't cover myself in glory, but uh, I saw you got a score? Six. Did you tally your score? Solid six. Six? It's a pass mark. Fantastic. And you know what's great about that is that these quizzes tend to be, they do two things. They hopefully point in the direction, make you think about things, or maybe make, make you want to look something up and make you realize that don't worry about it. You only know it if you know it. Exactly. And the other thing is, is that there are people out there in our lounge, in our community, people that perhaps it's not their jobs or anything, it's their passion, but they're super, super knowledgeable as well. You'd be amazed at the amount of people get really high scores week on week. And as I say, there's no prize here. They're only playing against themselves as well. Alistair Gray is saying Aquavite. Thank you, Gordon. Absolutely. He's put lots of exclamation marks as well. Gordon, you've been a fantastic and eloquent and very succinct guest to have. It's been wonderful listening no, to you. Thank I'm you. Very glad that you were able to act as a wingman for me as well. And what I said earlier about you being a barfly, the reason I reached out to you is because you were active in these V-pubs. And yep. for that, I'm very grateful. Thank you. Not at all. No, it's, I think what you're doing is great, Roy, and congratulations on your, uh, on your uh, 10,000th uh, fantastic and thank keep you the good work up. We we, we 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 do watch what you're up to and we think you're great. So <laughs> Glengoyne are watching, Ian McLeod are watching. Super excited to hear about what's happening at Rose Bank. That's a discussion yeah. that maybe we can touch upon at some time in the future, Gordon. And maybe I'll just bump into you this weekend and bring in some friends up to Glengoyne again. I love coming up there. It's a wonderful place to go. So picturesque, very warm and friendly welcome we always get from the people there too. Per Christensen has sent along a, a virtual dram. He's a star. Thanks for a great VPUB, Gordon and Roy. And congrats with the 10K subs. I'm going to hold up this wee dram of uh, European uh, oak. We think it's Glengoyne, right? And say cheers, Per. Thank you so much out in Denmark. Uh, just grab, grab a couple. Karen saying thanks, Gordon. Superb V Pub. Thanks, Karen. Great evening, Roy and Gordon. Congrats, Roy. Uh, that's from uh, Service Alafis and Danny. E. Um, and uh, Gixer Skipper is saying thank you, Roy and Gordon and Slancher. Fantastic. Slancher. Yes. And oh, just quickly before I finish up. Over the course of um, the next couple of weeks, I'll need to work out when the VPUBs are actually going to land because of the movements and things, because of this is a, being a five-week month as well. Uh, I was going to tr look at doing one on Thursday next week. It may still happen, but it's Halloween, so it might be tough. It might be difficult. So I think it may fall into the start of the following month. If that's the case, I'll need to find other ways to share with you the November 10th event, uh, the gathering in Glasgow, which will be the day after the Glasgow Whiskey Festival. 
It will be limited in numbers because if we do a structured thing, we can only get about 30 drams out of a bottle. So it be, will be a maximum of 30 people, but I'll share that uh, and let people know as soon as I get a venue tied down. So thanks to everybody for joining tonight. I hope you found um, the topic interesting. I certainly did. Um, it's something that's very dear to our hearts, clearly. And uh, if you've got any questions, I think I'd be okay in saying, Gordon, to put it in the comments below, and maybe at some point in the week ahead or something, you can pick up the comments. And if there's anything directed to you, you can pick it up yourself. I will try and do that, yeah. Yeah, Definitely. no problem. Um, thank you very much for the drams tonight as well. Remember, if you're interested in winning that Ralphie bottle, just mention in the comments below, not the chat, in the actual comments, just put in Barfly. Congrats on the Big Ten. And I will enter you into a draw to win the Ralphie bottling as well. All that remains, Gordon, is for me to raise a glass and say, th say thank you so much for being so indulgent, so patient, and so insightful, my friend. Thank you for your generosity. Slancher. Pleasure. Anytime. All the best. Cheers. And until next time, Barflies, thank you all for your wonderful, wonderful participation. Thanks for building this channel up to be what it's becoming. It's wonderful to be a part of. I always say it, and I don't mean it. Uh, I mean it fully and sincerely. It is a privilege to be able to do this. Thank you so much. And until next time, Slanchava. Mm -hmm.